Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Finance and Corporate Services Committee. Uh, we will get right into it because we have a full day today. Uh, to start off, can I get a mover for the uh, consent items moved by Councillor Anaitis? Uh, any questions on the consent items? Councillor, no, no questions on the consent items? A comment? Okay. Councillor Anaitis? 
I hear the Union Burger is really good. I had some at the, I had some at uh, in uh, Port Elgin, and uh, my wife really loves it. So go and, go and check it out. Let the record state that Union Burger is fantastic. Okay, Councillor Gazzola. There are two th two things. The first one I wanted to know that they're they're allowed to stay open until two. Is that the same as what everyone else does now, or? In this, in this Sarah? case, there the head office is, owns Krabby Joe's and Coffee Culture, who have liquor licenses and they know how to operate using a liquor license. So therefore, they're allowed to be open longer than some of those that don't have any experience. Okay, I didn't have a problem with that because I know that we had one just down the street that we didn't allow, and I think when they're starting up, they need as much help as they can get. Uh, the other question I had was to do with item number three, and I see that, and I, I might have asked this before, but what, what does it really mean to have that 30% monthly ratio, and, and do we ever check it, or, you know, if it's, what happens if that, how do you test that, or what happens? And the point I'm trying to get at, if it's not a, it's not something we're doing. Why, you know, why are we imposing it here? Ms. Harris? It's a condition, a standard condition that's put into our agreements, and that agreement is sent to the AGCO, and if they choose, they can put it on to the liquor license, and once it's on the liquor license, it's part of the AGCO's liquor license, and they, they uh, do the enforcement of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, no further questions? Oh, Mayor's there. I, thank you. I don't have a question. I was, uh, the question did come up, though, and I just checked with staff. I think this is the first time that um, uh, we are, uh, our committee meeting is being streamed, live streamed. So just uh, so the council is aware of that. that, that that's correct. Sorry, I meant to mention that. Uh, it's not being live streamed, actually. It's not being live streamed to the Internet. It's just uh, test runs, so oh, it's just it's internally test. being internally recorded. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> Uh, again, so no further questions. Uh, those in favor of the consent items? And opposed, that's none. We will... Councillor Fernandez? Sorry, I meant to do this before um, we started. Um, it, now I, I see Kelly is not here, Councillor Galloway, Selak is not here. Um, I've, it's been brought to my attention by my health practitioner that I've got um, as a result of a, a tremendous increased sitting from my previous job that I am now suffering with some sciatica issues. Um, I know that um, Councillor Singh and Councillor Gazzola all have issues of sitting and I know in uh, Councillor Sela uh, Galloway's situation she shouldn't be sitting long. So I'm going to ask kindly of the chair and all the chairs today um, and for any meetings in the future that at the two hour point we spend five minutes getting up, walking around. I realize that this could add additional minutes because we all start getting chatty. But um, a five minute stretch I think is going to be really good for all of us in our health. We do, we, we want the same health standards and, and good working conditions for our staff and I think we should ask and respect the same for ourselves. Absolutely. Um, on that as well, I'm making a note here, but um, should I go too long or skip it or forget, please any member of council if you wanted to ring in and say could be have a, a quick break, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> we'll move on to uh, item number three, the downtown uh, business improvement area. And uh, Mr. Goody. Thank you through Chair Davey. On May 13th, council gave direction to staff to issue notice of the passage of a, a potential passage of a while to expand the boundaries of uh, the downtown Kitchener business improvement area. Accordingly, we issued 267 notices to all the prescribed uh, business property classes within the existing boundaries, which is indicated uh, within the blue uh, on the map that's on the screen, as well as to those person or to the prescribed business classes that are in the newer proposed area, which is uh, outlined in red. Uh, from, those, from those notices, we only received four objections. 
one of which was uh, disqualified as it was received from a tenant who was, uh, does not pay any portion of the property taxes or levy for that property and therefore was ineligible to uh, submit objections. The other objections, two of which were received from properties within the existing boundary and the other one was in the new or proposed boundary. Those three uh, objections uh, did not come close to meeting the established thresholds uh, required by the Act, so there are no uh, legislated barriers to prevent Council from passing the, the uh, bylaw, which is attached to the staff report, and uh, staff are recommending uh, approval of said bylaw. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, questions? Councillor Gazzola? When, when does this bylaw take effect? Through Chair Davey, this would take effect as of uh, January 1st, 2014. Uh, that's to align with when the new uh, levy will be, uh, will be applied. Uh, it would have been, uh, this is a very good map. Uh, it would have, I've tried to figure that out, yes, on the black and white, and I couldn't figure it out. It would have been nice to have received this in our packs maybe in the future. This color is very useful. I, my, uh, my, I'm not surprised at where we're going here, but uh, did, uh, what, what impact does this have on, on these, new, these new properties that are now coming under the, uh, under the BIA? Do we, do we have any idea? Like what, what does this do to their tax? This is gonna be like a tax increase for them. And just, you know, what is the impact? I, I'm quite surprised that, that, that not more have, have uh, objected or have they questioned that or are they pleased with that? Like they, the amount of money coming in for the BIA right now is about 700000 and that's going to go up by another $250,000. That's, that's quite a substantial change. Mr. Bloom on the fees. Uh, through the chair, I don't know the exact uh, uh, levy rate, uh, but on a, about 1,000 square feet, it works out to uh, roughly $600 uh, a year in extra taxes. Um, just want to make the point, this is just, most BIAs operate as, and, and the, the uh, comment they usually make is it's a self-inflicted in, uh, tax levy. So it's, they're inflicting it on themselves for the purposes of, of raising money to support the BIA, which in turn supports their, uh, uh, their business ventures. So we only uh, had the one uh, objection. We had one person ask about the rate, and when they heard about what the rate was, they were satisfied that it wasn't uh, uh, an, a major encumbrance. From what I understand, there are about 60 new properties that come under this. Do, do, yep. do, we, do we know the assessment of what those, what those properties were? Is that included here or not? Sorry, the assessment yeah. of the properties? Okay, I won't hold. Everybody seems to be happy with this. I, I'm, uh, I'm quite surprised there wasn't uh, more. Uh, a greater number of people speaking up, but that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Councillor Yuneski. <clears throat> yeah, just a couple of questions. Um, I noticed on the map that you handed out that the boundary change, you've got the existing BA boundary and a proposed, and in the existing, are there going to be some properties that are going to be eliminated from the downtown the BA district as well? Uh, Mr. Mr. Bloom, sorry, there you go. One second here. There, go ahead. Uh, through the chair, yes, there, there are a few, but uh, the ones that are being eliminated are uh, residential properties, so they don't actually contribute any money to the, uh, uh, to the BIA. That's really on the, uh, uh, some properties past uh, Cedar Street. Uh, so you can, you can see that we've uh, included the two properties uh, on the south end of the intersection of King and Cedar uh, are still in the boundary. They are uh, commercial uh, properties that do uh, contribute, but the ones that do not have been uh, uh, eliminated. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is that you did have uh, four objections, of which three are the more legitimate, you're saying. 
Did you get any uh, responses in, in support of this expansion? Um, through the chair, Davy, there's no uh, there's no formal uh, responses received in support. Uh, the act, as part of the notice, just advises sort of how to file an appeal or an objection to it. I know, though, that the BIA, as well as economic development staff, did go out and do um, quite a bit of public consultation. And so, Corey might be better able to speak to the feedback he received as part of that process. Sure. Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, Shannon uh, Weber from the BIA met with all of the major uh, property owners who would have uh, seen the biggest uh, impact, and uh, all of them, uh, at least in, in, in her discussions with them, were supportive of, of this change. Okay, and the three objections that you got were on what, what grounds? Uh, through the chair, I think the two within the existing boundary, uh, I don't think fully understood the question being asked. Um, I don't even think they actually realized that they were in an existing BIA boundary. <laughs> um, the, the, really the one that uh, uh, was really the sole objector uh, outside of the existing boundary, uh, for him uh, and his company, he just believed uh, the BIA didn't add value to his business and then hence didn't want to pay the additional uh, tax levy. Okay, thanks. Councillor Rabinovich. Thank you very much. Um, just further to the question that uh, Councillor Yonetsky asked with respect to the properties on Cedar that are being removed. I, I recognize they're residential properties right now, um, but are, and as residential properties, they don't get charged the surcharge, is that correct? So does it make sense to be removing them? I mean, I, I think particularly of the properties at Cedar and Charles, um, you know, I don't know what their specific zoning is, but with the uh, the LRT hub going uh, to be, or not the hub, but rather one of the stations going to be in that area, I can see the potential for redevelopment. So does it not make sense to leave them in the uh, BIA boundary and then we don't need to uh, revisit the, the boundary issue if they're redeveloped at that time? Uh, through the chair. Uh Certainly not an incorrect statement. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of the BIA's longer term intent, uh, ultimately they want to see their uh, boundaries align with uh, the city's downtown boundaries, uh, which for the most part, you know, beyond this phase would mean extending out to, uh, to include uh, the remainder of the innovation district uh, out to Bright Up and uh, the rail lines. Uh, so they see this as a first phase of, and in, in subsequent years when uh, uh, they feel timing is right, they would expand further. So I think that's another opportunity where uh, if there is redevelopment south of Cedar Street, then perhaps that's the, the, the time and place to, uh, uh, to move the boundary even further uh, south if it, if it makes sense. Okay, so you don't, you don't expect um, any sort of redevelopment on those properties in the near future? Uh, through the chair, I would say not in the next uh, three to five years. I think okay. it's a longer term. Uh... Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Yes, thank you. Um, just uh, seeking for a better clarification on the map. So it's uh, quite clear as to the, the defined boundary change for the proposed BIA uh, properties. Um, but for the downtown urban growth boundary, so which is the city's uh, downtown boundary, uh, is there a change that's being made on that one as well, or that's existing as is? Uh, through the chair, no, that's, uh, that boundary is, is uh, set and isn't changing. Uh, essentially, if you're looking at the map, uh, the BI boundaries would shift from the blue line currently to the red line right. uh, proposed. So, and that's where my question laid. Um, so you, you see along King Street, obviously, uh, uh, beyond the, the railway tracks. So the, uh, the, the perimeter building, so the, the bright up uh, development that's happening there, that's outside of the uh, downtown boundary. What would be the, uh, uh, I guess, the reasoning of leaving that out, uh, especially the, that being a strong, uh, I guess, a business generator in the, in the near future? Uh, through the chair, uh, so to speak on behalf of, uh, of the BIA, who ultimately, uh, this, was, this was their proposed boundary. Uh, I think it was, it was in part that the building uh, you know, isn't fully leased, isn't fully occupied, um, and, and, and in part, uh, uh, you know, their capacity to, to bring on uh, new businesses. Uh, they did debate whether they just expand to the fullness of the boundary today, and uh, I believe their, 
response was that uh, they just didn't have the staffing capacity to to handle that uh, that much additional uh, levy and um, new membership. Uh, so I think their their logical mind said, uh, let's wait until uh, the innovation district is is far more built out, including the Breda block, and and come back in uh, two to three years time and uh, propose to expand later. So. Uh, and that was just the rationale that they used. Okay, so that's what I assumed, that we would probably be revisiting this again, and that kind of speaks to some of the uh, Councillor uh, Brabenovich's concerns, especially development along the, uh, the LRT route. Uh, you'll probably see development beyond the boundaries that are set right now. Okay, thank you. And quick question, Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Does that mean that all the areas that, in, that are in gray are exempt at this point? And is that what that means? Uh, through the chair, pardon, I, I didn't fully hear the question. That all the areas on this map that are in gray, inside those blue and red lines, they're exempt. Uh, through the chair, uh, in white. Uh, so the gray, well, at least in the map, the color map, the gray is the building. Uh, if the property, I believe, is colored white, that's an exempt uh, property because it's either a uh, a public entity or or uh, a place of worship. Well, we're looking at the, uh, at the the big mall on King and King and Frederick and Duke. Is is that exempt or is that uh, through the chair? No, that one would be included. That one uh, they pay the levy as does uh, the Manual Life Building. Uh, basically, everything. I know it's hard to see. Uh, on some of the properties where the gray buildings extend to the edges, but anywhere you can see reddish pink, uh, that's a commercial property that would be affected by uh, the tax levy. So the whole property is? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, no further questions. I'm, uh, I would be open to comments now. Any comments on this? Councillor Glenn Graham. Just briefly, because uh, I represent the downtown and Councillor Etherington isn't here. Uh, the BAA has had a lot of interest, bless you, in uh, supporting the expansion from businesses within and beyond the current boundaries. So I think this is something where Councillor Yuneski asked about the, the positive responses. We don't have uh, any written, but we do have a lot of anecdotal responses and a lot of positive feedback about the work the BAA has done. This is a really um, a, a vote of confidence in the current work that they're doing and the vision that they've, they've uh, expressed. Okay. Uh, apologies, uh, I needed a mover. Could you be okay, moved by Councillor Glenn Graham, Councillor Nettis? I'm just going to declare a security interest in that I have property downtown. Property in the downtown, okay. okay. Noted. Okay, a recorded vote has been called. Um, The voting is open. And that carries. Very good. We will be moving on to item number four, but I just need to give uh, our clerk a moment to reset. What, while, while we're waiting, Councillor Nettis? I have a pecuniary interest as well on, on uh, this on, item as well. Item number four. As the high property downtown. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Singh. Yes, I, um, I think I do have a conflict as well as my parents own uh, property. And the, the defined green, if you look at the previous map that we just had, in the, uh, the green part, which is the downtown urban growth boundary. So any incentives would be for that defined area or would it be within the BIA 
uh, boundaries. So any incentive yeah. benefit through, would apply to. Through the chair, if you, uh, if in your staff report you, you switch to page 4-32, uh, you'll see the exact boundary, which is relatively close to the urban growth center boundary. If, if the property in question is within that gray boundary, then, then it would be uh, uh, potentially uh, able to benefit from the incentives. Okay, in that case, I'll declare a pecuniary interest as well. Okay, so for the clerk, Councillors Idonitis and Singh have declared a pecuniary interest. And just let me know when you're ready, Mr. Green. Okay, we're good to go. Mr. Bloom, when you're ready. Uh, good morning, members of the uh, committee. Um, before I get into sort of the meat of uh, uh, the incentive review, I just wanted to give you an idea of the process. Uh, so we're, we're in phase one right now. Uh, it's essentially a two-phase process. Uh, phase one uh, really is for, uh, for you as council to ultimately provide staff uh, with a series of recommendations uh, that give us direction on what changes you want made to uh, any of the incentive programs uh, that we've got. Uh, phase two would be the actual changes to the programs. Most of, actually all of these programs require some form of statutory process before you can change them. Uh, so really this first phase is just for you to, to give staff uh, direction on what, what changes you want us to bring forward. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, phase one, uh, staff completed its uh, comprehensive review and we tabled the discussion paper in May. Uh, we've been meeting with stakeholders uh, uh, in the community uh, since then. Uh, today's purpose is really to have a full discussion uh, uh, with you. Uh, in the staff report, we've included preliminary recommendations. Uh, what we'll do after today is we'll, t we'll take your feedback and we'll come back to you probably in September uh, with, with formal recommendations for you to, uh, to consider. Uh, at which time that would be the end of, uh, of phase uh, one. So we're really not looking for any formal recommendations today. Uh, that will happen in, in September. This is really just a chance for, uh, for a good discussion. So, uh, you know, why do uh, an incentive review uh, now? Um, there's a few reasons. Uh, first is most of uh, the programs actually originated almost 20 years ago. Uh, and obviously the context of downtown is very different today than it was 20 years ago. Uh, for those that perhaps don't remember uh, downtown in 1995, uh, for, I was not downtown in 1995, I was in high school, so uh, I've just from what I can glean from, uh, uh, from various reports, uh, it wasn't in a good state. Uh, it's been phrased that the business community essentially had turned its back on, on the downtown uh, in the 90s for a series of reasons. Uh, and with uh, increased uh, suburban expansion and the arrival of big box, uh, the situation looked like it wasn't going to get any better, but in fact, downtown was, was going to get worse. So the uh, then mayor, uh, Christie at the time, formed what uh, was called the Mayor's Task Force, uh, where they brought together business leaders and community leaders and uh, to, to determine a, a process for uh, improving the downtown. And the conclusion they came to was that downtown essentially needed to be open for business, which means uh, take away any possible encumbrances, uh, whether that be zoning or uh, development process, uh, as well as offer uh, any incentives that, you, that we possibly could, uh, basically to attract uh, business to the core. Uh, and it was essentially, well, we're, if I could paraphrase, happy to take whatever we can get. Uh, I would say that the context today is much different than that. Uh, there's significant energy and excitement about the downtown and significant opportunity. So uh, it's, a, it's a perfect time to, uh, to review. Uh, one of the, the, the contextual changes from 1995 to today is that uh, I believe the community has a much higher expectation of what they want to see downtown than perhaps they did uh, in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, to give you an example, uh, one of the, uh, the, the buildings that benefited from the current uh, incentive program uh, is the uh, relatively new apartment building at uh, Queen and Weber. Uh, I believe it received roughly a million and a half worth of incentives and uh, the community response was, you know, great that we've got 200 new residential units downtown, uh, but they really disliked the look of the building. And the reaction was, you know, if, if the city is offering incentives, we expect a higher quality end product uh, uh, than, than what that building uh, did. 
So that's just one example of, of what we think the community's priorities have, have shifted slightly. A uh, few other reasons uh, why this is a, a timely review is uh, the current development charge uh, bylaw will expire and we, we have to enact a new one next year. Uh, our facade grant program uh, will end at the end of this year and we have to make decisions on whether we continue that uh, program or not. And uh, what may seem slightly unrelated but it will make sense a little later on is, uh, is our parks uh, staff are uh, becoming more and more concerned about uh, the amount of pressure being put on Victoria Park uh, today and moving forward with more uh, intensification that, uh, uh, that we may need to uh, look at other options to, to, to alleviate some of that pressure, which is essentially just a volume of people using it and, uh, uh, and the wear and tear that that causes. So all of those uh, uh, we think are, are reasons why we should in, uh, undertake the review, uh, which is what we've done. So to give you some context, there are essentially three buckets of incentives. Uh, there are those that are targeted downtown at major redevelopments. Uh, you can see the four uh, uh, the, the, in the top group. There are a series of what I would call targeted incentives, which are not necessarily meant for the major redevelopment uh, projects, but more targeted at, uh, you know, f uh, for the use of businesses or uh, store owners. Uh, and you can see those. Uh, and then there's a group of citywide uh, incentives which aren't part of this review. Uh, we just wanted to look at the top two that are exclusive to the downtown. Uh, Brownfield remediation, adaptive reuse, and heritage tax uh, rebates aren't part of this, uh, this review. So in the discussion paper, uh, there's four main uh, sections, and I'm going to walk you through uh, each of those. Uh, the first is just to talk about today's uh, economic context. We evaluated all of our current programs to see how they uh, match up with today's context. Uh, we look at our ability to fund these incentives and then some options and recommendations for moving forward. So what's today's economic context look like? Um, we developed a series of, of pro formas uh, for three different types of, uh, of redevelopments. Uh, essentially, uh, the rule of thumb is that if this formula doesn't work for any development uh, that's privately funded, which means that the, the, the amount of money they expect to make on a project, if that isn't 15% higher than the cost of construction, nothing gets built. So if this formula doesn't work downtown, nothing gets built downtown. Uh, and essentially taxes don't, we don't see tax assessment growth because we, we don't see uh, new development. So what is included in the development cost? Uh, you can see the list there. Uh, the one aspect that uh, we as a municipality have uh, an ability to control is the development fees, uh, which in some cases can actually equal up to 15% of the cost of, of development. So uh, we do in fact have uh, an ability to affect a project being profitable or not, and hence being built or not. So we built some uh, performers to try to, to, to test whether we could meet this threshold. Uh, this gives you an idea of, uh, for, that made, for that top bucket of incentives for the major redevelopments, uh, the kind of value they provide. Uh, the, the program is down the left-hand side, so the three-year tax exemption all the way down to the development charge exemption. And you can see for the different types of redevelopment uh, how much that equates to. So the easiest one usually to understand is residential condos. You add up the, uh, the value of the four incentives and it works out to about $16,000 uh, per unit. And you can sort of see the rest. These are all contained in the report uh, if I move too fast for you. So uh, what we did is we, we, we built these performers and we, we tried to put them on one graph that uh, we hope is easy to understand. Uh, so this is the first one. So for a, uh, uh, I should say 300 unit residential condo, uh, on the bottom is the cost of construction, which uh, can range typically anywhere from $146 a square foot up to $200 a square foot. On the left-hand column, you see the sale price that per square foot that uh, you would have to sell a building at in order to, be, to, to hit your 15% profit without any incentives. So that blue line tells you what kind of sale price they would need to get if we weren't involved. So for example, uh, at $200 a square foot, if that's the cost of construction, they can, that can only be profitable if they're able to get sales prices in the, the range of $365 uh, a foot. Um, what we've shown you with the, the two dashed lines, uh, the purple is the average sale price of uh, residential condo units downtown over the past five years. 
So this is Kaufman, Le Marche, Arrow, et cetera. Uh, on average, uh, they're selling at uh, roughly 316. The one high one, that's uh, one Victoria, which is uh, probably the highest sale prices we've seen to date, and that was uh, roughly 362 bucks a foot. Uh, so what, uh, what, you can con what we conclude from this is uh, that we could see development, uh, and, and, it, and it would happen uh, if buildings were built between 146 and 162 dollars a foot, because the, ne the needed sale price is below uh, the average. The challenge, of course, is that uh, the types of buildings that uh, I think staff want to see and we think the community wants to see, uh, whether that's high quality architecture, good quality materials, LEED certification, um, those types of buildings typically cost from $175 to $200 a square foot. So uh, city center condos, uh, one Victoria, uh, those are all, those all cost somewhere in the range of $175 to $200. Uh, typically closer to the 200. So if we want to see high quality uh, uh, design with uh, many of these great features, it's not feasible in today's, uh, with today's prices. This is the, uh, the same analysis, but for uh, a, a rental situation. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's the same uh, numbers on the bottom and the same numbers on the side. Uh, so, in order to be profitable, uh, if you're building a building at $200 a square foot, uh, you need to lease it at $1.86. Uh, this one looks far better uh, because most of the blue dots are below the average, uh, but I will say that the, the high mark of $2.29 a foot, uh, that is what Kaufman uh, lofts are renting at, and that is the highest rental rate we've seen in the region. Uh, it's, and it's far and above any other project. Uh, most of the apartments you'd be familiar with, uh, uh, they're typically renting at around $1.30. Uh, so the ones that were, have gone up around Victoria Park, uh, if you're familiar with Eugene Drulo's projects, his are typically renting around $1.30 a foot, uh, which is below what uh, the profitability uh, mark would be. Uh, a developer like that, there's, there are other reasons why he's able to build and, and, and make profit while most uh, others can't. This is the, uh, a major office redevelopment, uh, which you can see the blue line is far above uh, both the average and the peak uh, rate. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, in order to build the highest quality building we could at $242 a foot, you'd have to lease it at $30, uh, almost $31 a foot, plus your, your cam fees. These are Boston, San Diego, uh, Silicon Valley rates. So. Uh, I like to say, this is, this is why we haven't seen a new uh, office building built in any of the urban areas in our region in probably over a decade, uh, unless it was purposely built for, an, for a predetermined tenant uh, or done for government purposes. It's simply the numbers uh, don't work. Uh, the main encumbrance here is, is structured parking. Uh, that's about a third of the development cost, so that's why you can, you'll see office being built in the suburbs with uh, surrounded by parking, but it becomes uh, 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 economically impossible in an urban setting. If you, uh, if you look at uh, the same scenario, but done uh, with the intent of ultimately selling it to a REIT, uh, much like uh, the tannery, for example, uh, Caden built it, but they ultimately sold it, sold it to, uh, uh, to a REIT. Uh, the numbers are a little better, it's a little closer, and the reason is that REITs typically don't pay financing fees because they typically have cash in hand, uh, and financing is a significant chunk of, uh, of the cost. So we, we, we get close in that scenario, uh, but again, to, to build on spec in hopes of filling the building and selling it to a REIT is, is a risky business that few uh, uh, are willing to do. So based on those scenarios, our conclusions uh, are that uh, the market isn't quite ready for us to, to completely be out of the incentive game, that incentives are still uh, critically important if we want to see uh, privately funded development happen downtown. That was the big bucket. Uh, in terms of the target incentives, um, there's really no way of coming up with the same economic model to determine whether they're, uh, they're important or necessary or not. Uh, so we just simply have to go on interest. Um, so to give you an idea, the facade loan program, uh, which we discontinued in 2009, over a five-year period, it uh, facilitated six uh, facade improvements, which were probably the only facades that got fixed in those, uh, that five-year period. Uh, we turned that program into a grant program in 2009, and we've already seen 45 projects completed. 
Uh, we have another, I think, 15 that are uh, on the books. And uh, ultimately, over about a five-year, six-year period, we'll see uh, probably close to 70 to 75 uh, storefronts uh, be uh, improved, uh, which, based on the previous five years, uh, tells you that there's significant interest and in, in importance in that uh, uh, in that program. Uh, those 75 businesses represent about half of probably the total uh, building stock. Uh, building permit rebates, uh, you can see it's fairly active. We've had 21 rebates uh, since 2006. Uh, what's interesting of note is uh, the vast majority, I think 18 of those 21, uh, were for uh, smaller projects. So whether that's a, a, a retailer uh, redoing their interior of their building, uh, that tend to be the typical uh, uh, user of that program. Um, in our discussions with the, uh, uh, the major developers, this program is the building permit rebate is, is I don't want to call it a drop in the bucket, but it's less important to them in terms of its financial value. But it is critically important for the small businesses who, uh, you know, to get their uh, uh, building permit rebate uh, can be the difference between them fixing up their store and not. In terms of Upper Story Loan Program, it was a program that we, we ran for five years. Uh, we had six projects, six really great projects, uh, but we just found there wasn't uh, significant interest uh, in that program, so we, uh, we uh, haven't extended it beyond 2010. So uh, our conclusions on the targeted incentives, you'll see later, is that uh, the Facade Grant Program is, is, seems to be critically uh, important to, to facilitate redevelopment, and uh, there's a, an importance in the building permits for, for smaller users. Uh, so the next section uh, that I'll get into is the evaluation of, of our current incentives. So within those two buckets, uh, there's essentially six programs. You can see them listed down the left-hand side. Uh, we evaluated them based on six criteria, and you can see those across the top. So is it financially relevant to the end user? Uh, does it make a difference between them going ahead and not going ahead? Uh, is it user-friendly for them, or is it uh, a very difficult program for them to navigate? The middle two uh, speak to the importance of, of quality. Uh, so would staff and council have discretion about who gets an incentive and not? And uh, the fourth one is, can we impose ob objectives uh, like lead certification or, uh, or design standards? Uh, the fifth one is, is it financially predictable uh, for a budget or is it open-ended and unpredictable? And we don't know how much every year it could uh, cost us. And then the last one is it easy for staff to administer. So we, uh, we carefully reviewed all six, and this is, you can see it on page 15 if you want to see it in full, uh, but this was uh, our conclusions that really only the facade uh, grant program was uh, meeting all six of those objectives. All other five in some way, shape, or form could use some, uh, uh, some changes to meet all six of, of those objectives. Uh, and you can see the three-year tax exemption, for example, didn't hit any of those uh, objectives. Uh, So then, what then is our, you know, if we, if we see a need for incentives, what's our capacity to fund these incentives? Um, if you took all of the money uh, that we have set aside uh, already in existing budgets and you were to pool that in one pot, you've got about $3.5 million uh, left. Uh, which, you know, if we're talking about major redevelopments, that's two, maybe three uh, redevelopment projects before that money would be uh, uh, fully exhausted. And as you know, if you wanted to uh, increase that amount by a million dollars a year, for example, then it's for every million, it's a 1% uh, tax increase. Two side notes there. Um, I mentioned uh, our, the concern of our park staff about the need for uh, new park land to take some of the load off of Victoria Park. Uh, one of the ways of financing that, as you know, is through cash in lieu of, of parkland dedication, which right now we're not collecting in the downtown. Uh, which could be a source of revenue to help uh, finance that acquisition. And we'll talk a little bit later on about uh, a need that staff have identified for a new program, uh, which we're calling a landing pad program, but we'll, we'll give you more detail about that in a second. So, uh, so we've sort of shown you the, con the economic context. We've shown you uh, how our uh, programs stack up, and we've shown you our ability to fund uh, based on, on those three uh, sets of analysis, we've come up with these five options for moving forward. Uh, and you'll see in the report pros and cons uh, for each. So number one is status quo, stay as is. Uh, the biggest uh, reason 
uh, or the biggest concern with uh, the status quo option is a number of those programs. Uh, the development charge exemption, for example, uh, it's an open-ended uh, program with no upset limit for funding. So if you had five major projects come in within a year, uh, the City of Waterloo experienced this, uh, we would be searching for uh, many millions of dollars uh, to help back fund uh, those, those payments. Uh, option number two is the one that uh, uh, we're suggesting, which I'll go into a little more detail, but basically let's stay with uh, the existing programs, but let's modify them to meet uh, today's needs. We looked at the option of uh, you know, taking that uh, remaining funding, the 3.5 million and any money that we would add to that, and just do one consolidated grant. So have one program, not four, and give out uh, you know, one or two grants a year to the biggest and best projects that, uh, that came forward. Uh, the, the challenge with that is is that this council would be continually required or needing to find money to keep funding uh, that that uh, pot once the, the existing 3.5 is is gone uh, and it may you know in a year where you may have four projects that need it you'd only be able to finance one or two uh, we looked at uh, option number four which is you know let's not do incentives let's try to affect the other side of the equation which is uh, the purchase price by doing strategic initiatives uh, that uh, uh, you know, would, would uh, be cause for people to pay more to live downtown. Uh, the challenge with those uh, types of initiatives is they take time to uh, come to fruition and uh, we would probably see all of the projects that are already in the queue uh, grind to a halt and not go forward uh, because the incentives wouldn't be available for them. And then option five is discontinue all the programs and just let the market uh, uh, run its course, which based on our economic analysis would suggest that uh, we wouldn't see uh, very much development moving forward unless it was uh, largely publicly funded. So based on that, we've, uh, we've concluded that option two is, is, is the best approach, and this is what we're suggesting uh, we would do. So if you look at the major uh, redevelopment buckets, uh, what we're suggesting is uh, we eliminate the three-year tax exemption and the building permit rebate uh, uh, from this bucket. Uh, these are these programs do come as a cost uh, to the taxpayer. Uh, although there we can set a limit of, of funding, it is a cost to the taxpayer. Uh, they are the smallest and, and generally speaking, the less uh, significant of the of the incentives. What we're suggesting with the parkland dedication fee, uh, which currently now nobody pays parkland dedication downtown, we're actually instead of an exemption, suggesting a reduction, which seems like we're going the opposite direction. We're actually adding more of a cost onto the, uh, uh, to the developer. Uh, but what we're saying is let's put a modest cost on there. Uh, you know, we've suggested, you know, if we could, if 100% is what we're allowed to ask for, let's ask for 15% of that. So it still uh, isn't an encumbrance, but it's generating some uh, revenue for us to potentially acquire uh, parkland in the future that's uh, close to the downtown. The most significant change though is uh, what we're suggesting is going from a development charge waiver uh, to an exemption. So I'll sort of pause here and give you sort of a fuller explanation of what this means. This is probably the more critical element of, uh, uh, of this proposal. Uh, presently, uh, there are three essentially uh, rings of the downtown or the, the, the development charge bylaw. There's a suburban rate. Uh, there's an urban rate essentially for everything within the bounds of the expressway. Uh, they pay a slightly reduced rate from the suburban uh, rate and then there's the downtown, uh, which the, the developers essentially get their fee uh, waived. But what that means is, uh, is that the city is actually back paying that, uh, those dollars. So uh, by a city center, for example, when it builds, it's not just a foregone revenue that we're just saying, no, we're not gonna collect it. Uh, we waive it and in fact, uh, we have to find the money uh, to pay those incentives. And that goes into the development charge fund, which gets used for uh, suburban expansion. So it's, it is a cost to the taxpayer to offer it as a, in the current uh, uh, situation. What we're suggesting we do is we go back to the approach we took uh, pre-2009, uh, which is essentially to, instead of offering a waiver, you uh, cut a hole in, in the bylaw so that the bylaw doesn't actually apply to the downtown. Uh, what that means for the developers is the same thing. They don't pay the development charge uh, uh, fee. Uh, but I mean, what it means for, for us is that we don't actually have to back fund that, uh, that waiver into the uh, uh, development charge fund. So you don't have to worry about uh, 
you know, three projects coming in and finding the money to back fund those, uh, those charges. Uh, sound too good, good to be true, there must be a catch. The catch is that uh, while this bylaw is, it would be in place, you can't go to the development charge fund to pay for growth related capital projects within the downtown boundary. Those would have to be uh, financed through the, uh, the capital budget. So that is the, uh, the inherent risk uh, with, with that approach. Um, although looking forward, uh, we don't see any major uh, growth related infrastructure costs coming in the next five years. Uh, so we think that uh, the shifts to these four programs and the suggested changes, uh, the, the impact to the developer, for example, for a residential condo is only about uh, $2,500, uh, but the, 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 the upside for us as a city is that most of that cost uh, is no longer a cost that's built into uh, our tax base. It's either foregone revenue uh, or just fees that aren't uh, collected. So we think that mitigates a lot of the financial risk uh, with, with development charges. Um, should make a point that uh, of the development charge uh, fee waiver, our portion is only about a third. Uh, the region uh, makes up two thirds of uh, that fee uh, waiver. And in fact, if you look at the 16,000, for example, for residential condo unit, which is the total value of the incentive right now, half of that comes from the region through the development charge uh, uh, waiver. Uh, it's important to note that they're going through this exact same uh, uh, exercise. Historically, they've uh, made it a point that they will just do whatever the local municipality does. So when City of Waterloo eliminated their exemption, the region followed suit and, and, and eliminated theirs. And as we provide ours, they, they, they provide theirs. Uh, certainly at a staff level, we've, we've strongly suggested to them that we we'd urge them to continue that, uh, uh, that approach. Um, but if there's a, a political uh, uh, position that this council wanted to take, uh, then certainly it's uh, for you to do. Just wanted to highlight the, uh, the importance of, of that issue. So included though in, in these changes is we su were suggesting that we would add uh, some policies to the official plan, which would enable us to, uh, to hold developments that would get incentives to, uh, to a higher standard, whatever those standards uh, would be determined to be. So that's the big bucket uh, for the major redevelopments. This is the suggested changes for those targeted incentives. Uh, what we're suggesting is the building permit rebate uh, program uh, continue, but we reduce the scope and shift some of the funding. So uh, presently, it's open to any, uh, any project uh, with no set up upset limit other than the availability of funding, which right now uh, we have roughly uh, $80,000 uh, that uh, gets put into this program on an annual basis. What we're suggesting is we will limit that to $10,000 a year and limit the uh, permit rebates to $1,000 per application. So it's essentially just targeted at uh, uh, shopkeepers and store owners or, or restaurant owners who uh, we've noticed for them, it's important for them to get uh, their permit rebate back. Uh, that can be the difference between going forward or not. And then what we're suggesting with the, uh, the remaining $70,000 uh, is that we dedicate that and direct that to the facade grant program so that the facade program would have uh, ongoing funding uh, that's already built into our capital budget. And then the third and final change is that we, uh, we eliminate the upper story grant program. Uh, we don't see any more interest today than we saw uh, when we stopped offering it a few years ago. And we take the remaining funding and shift it to what we're calling a landing pad grant program. So I'm going to give you a break for me, and I'm going to turn, uh, turn it over to Mr. Regeer, who's going to uh, talk about the landing pad grant program. Mr. Regeer. Oh, okay. Can we go over it's perhaps a little bit easier up here. Agreed. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, we've talked about the pr proposed landing pad program uh, uh, in the past. Um, I'll give you uh, the Coles notes. What we're proposing now to Council is that we allocate the remaining funding in the upper story uh, residential program reserve fund, which is in the amount of about uh, $600,000 to the startup landing pad program. Um, this uh, funding would be available to landlords and tenants that uh, came out of the Communitech uh, incubation program, there were technology startups. They would be potentially startups associated with uh, and supported by the Waterloo Region Small Business Center. And these funds would be used to offset their 
leasehold improvements up to a maximum of $40,000 per uh, floor of uh, upper story uh, space on, in the downtown. And, uh, you know, this would equate to approximately $10 per square foot. Um, and this would be entirely a matching grant program, so this would be, um, uh, we would contribute uh, an equal amount uh, up to $40,000 to what the, the, the tenant uh, invested or the landlord invested in leasehold uh, improvements. And eligible uh, costs would potentially include, um, uh, eligible costs would include uh, uh, workplace amenities. Um, we want to make sure that we've got high quality uh, upper story facade, so we want to make sure that uh, there's no bro broken glass in the windows and that uh, the facade is in good shape, as well as, uh, you know, potential um, uh, amenity costs like, for example, elevators. Um, we, there, there are a number of, uh, in terms of the rationale for this program, uh, we see some, some risks that are worth uh, considering. Uh, we're seeing fa an explosion of startup activity coming out of the Communitech hub right now. Um, a lot of the startups that, uh, that are being incubated in the tannery are receiving funding from uh, investors in, uh, in Toronto, in uh, Silicon Valley, and places like Boston and New York. Uh, those companies are under pressure to uh, locate in the uh, in in their in these larger centers. They uh, they're you know an investor from Silicon Valley might, uh, for example, argue that that uh, you know the the valley is the is the better place to uh, optimize the su chance of success for a for a startup. We we feel that it's important to embed the startups uh, here in our community in the downtown. Uh, our downtown is a perfect uh, larger scale incubator environment for, for, for startups and uh, it provides uh, a supportive environment with uh, easy access to their mentors and to their support network at the tannery and um, is there an ideal fit to, uh, to, the, to the downtown uh, because it's actually easier for us to retrofit upper story space for uh, startup uh, uh, incubation than it is to do it for residential uh, for fire code reasons. Um, there's a larger objective here as well and that is that our downtown is uh, now acquiring a reputation as uh, one of the top centers for startup uh, entrepreneurship in Canada. It's, uh, it's a place which has received uh, international press recently for, uh, for the, the energy of our startup ecosystem. We're starting to see people in California, New York, uh, uh, Boston pay attention to uh, what's going on here. And it provides one of the, uh, one of the most exciting growth opportunities for our, for our regional economy. Now, I'd like to just point out that um, all of the major companies which currently provide the bulk of employment in, this, in the Waterloo region were once startups. Uh, of course, we all remember uh, Research in Motion, BlackBerry, and the growth uh, that emerged out of that company in, uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, well worth noting that uh, Christie Digital was a, a startup, uh, Electro Home was a startup, Manulife, Schneider's, uh, desire to learn we're all startups at, uh, at one point in time and so our the importance of our startup ecosystem is that it provides the 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 feedstock that it f provides the the all of the small companies that ultimately can support our economy and gr and grow employment exponentially um, in in the future um, I'd like to also point out that really our, our uh, competition here, and this is an important point, we've, we've seen some discussion in the media about this program uh, and our position relative to our, uh, our sister cities, Cambridge and, and Waterloo. The important point here is that our competition is not Waterloo, it's not Cambridge. We are in competition here with Silicon Valley, with New York City, with Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, with Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, the great cities of North America and the world. Um, Zurich, Switzerland, London, UK, Paris, 
all Berlin, Germany have uh, high energy uh, startup ec ecosystems. And that is where our competition is. From an economic development point of view, we thoroughly embrace collaboration with, um, with uh, Waterloo and with Cambridge uh, on this project and uh, would look forward to, uh, to uh, start up uh, uh, landing pad programs in those cities if they, uh, if they chose to move in that direction. So that's it for me, Corey. So just the one, uh, uh, Rod sort of described what the program will look like. The one other option that uh, a community improvement plan programs like this would have is the ability for us to lease our uh, facilities to uh, third party operators who may operate them as the space as some form of landing pad uh, type program. Uh, so just making the note that most of our uh, buildings are within the existing CIP boundary with the exception of uh, 79 Joseph. So if that was a building that we wanted to consider as a potential landing pad, giving its pr proximity to, uh, to the hub and uh, the uh, uh, Kitchener Studio project, then that's something that we would we'd consider. Uh, just in terms of process, just to make sure you're clear though, uh, to put this program in place requires us to go through a public process which is a minimum of three months and there will be uh, a number of uh, uh, council discussions. So uh, at this point you're just suggesting to us whether you want us to pursue this or not. Uh, we're not actually approving this program. That wouldn't happen for, uh, for many, many months. So that was our analysis. What did we hear from, uh, from, from stakeholders? Uh, we heard three main points come out. Um, first one was simply, if uh, we're going to discontinue any programs, uh, please offer reasonable sunset dates. So those that have made decisions, development decisions based on the existing programs that they have a, a, the time window uh, to complete their projects uh, before the funding expires. Uh, one stakeholder suggested if you're going to look at reviewing uh, the, the current parkland dedication uh, policy, let's do that citywide, which I think is staff's intent anyway. Um, and then we had uh, uh, one stakeholder, uh, Fusion Homes, uh, suggest that we should consider expanding the boundary east to, uh, to Betzner to include the three, uh, three blocks south of the market that uh, you know, are, are prime for redevelopment and are, uh, surround the market and are close to the future rapid transit station. Uh, we were also asked to, uh, uh, to calculate uh, the number of years it would take uh, the city post-occupancy of a residential uh, condo unit. How many years would it take for us to collect the equivalent amount of, uh, of tax uh, revenue to equal the amount of incentive that we would uh, be giving that unit? Uh, so if the unit, was, an average unit price was $200,000, uh, it would take the city about 5.37 years before we collected the equivalent uh, tax revenue off of that new unit. Uh, if it was a $250,000 priced unit, then it's obviously shorter. Uh, and then you can also see the region's uh, numbers for their part of the development charge uh, uh, exemption. So it would take them 6.7 years, five years to recoup in, in uh, increased assessment, what they would have given in, as an incentive. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, we're open to uh, your feedback and comments. And, and as I said today, really, we want to hear your, your views uh, so that we can come back to you in September with uh, uh, any changes to the preliminary recommendations so that in September you can, uh, you can adopt formal recommendations, which would direct us to continue on into the implementation uh, phases. Uh, before I uh, uh, turn it over, I just did just want to th say thanks to a number of staff. Uh, this was a project that uh, a number of different departments participated in, so uh, uh, big thanks to all those that were involved. So with that, uh, these are the preliminary recommendations from the staff report. Just putting them up there for reference for you. Uh, we're open to uh, your, your questions and comments. Okay, thank you, uh, Corey and Rod, for the presentation. Uh, there are a number of questions. We will start uh, with Councillor Verbanovich. Thank you. I just want to check though. Is there a delegation on this or are they just here no. taking notes? Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, to uh, thank you for uh, clearly uh, a very thorough uh, analysis and, and report, uh, both of the program and where it's been and where, uh, where you think it, it needs to go uh, in the future. Um, I think it's actually pretty reflective of, of what 
Um, my, my gut feeling was in terms of which programs have, have been working and which ones have been um, less successful and, and some of the things that uh, I think we need to do um, going forward. I do have a few uh, questions though and, uh, and, and then a couple quick comments. But specifically on the uh, programs to, that are, are sort of encouraging more residential development, they really seem to be geared more towards the, the large scale condo um, as opposed to more intensified uses of properties either through um, brownstones or you know, lo low rise, low to mid rise uh, apartment building condos, that kind of thing. Um, should we not be ensuring that the, whatever programs we have in place are, are encouraging both of those um, kinds of things within the area? Uh, through the chair, I think the answer is yes. Um, most of these incentives, they, the, the value is typically per unit. Uh, so uh, whether you're building 10 units or 200 units, it's the same value per unit. Um, typically uh, speaking, if the building is three and a half stories or less, meaning it's typically built out of uh, wood frame as opposed to concrete construction, um, the pricing is far less than what I showed you. So the construction co costs uh, are typically around 100 to 135 dollars a foot, as opposed to you know the numbers I showed you, which can be as much as, as 200. Um, so what we've actually we've been having some some discussions with the Home Builders Associations to try to understand um, the economics around, you know, a, a stacked townhome that three, that's three and a half stories that doesn't need to be built out of concrete. Uh, is there a, a model for that downtown uh, and where is that appropriate? Uh, so I think it's something that we're evaluating because there's definitely a, it, you're more likely to see that type of development uh, finance without an incentive. Our incentives certainly encourage that uh, than the major developments. Okay. Um, and so I, I guess as part of this con that consultation, that's something that could potentially come back with later versions of this? Uh, through the chair, we're actually meeting with the home builders on Friday, so we'll ask them those very questions and report back in, in September. Okay, great. Um, I know one thing that um, I've raised in the past uh, and have asked staff to look at, and, and I don't know if this is one area where it, it could be looked at, and it's the notion of, of creating um, or, or encouraging a lead gold standard um, for developments, particularly in, in, in the downtown from a, a sustainability point of view. And um, I know other cities have, have looked at that. Um, one of the ways they've, uh, they've provided incentives for that is not necessarily through actual dollars, but uh, fast-tracking the application process. I think Vancouver is one that um, comes as an example of that because uh, ultimately time is money uh, for a developer and so the quicker they can get going, um, the faster they, uh, they can recoup their investment um, and, and put some of those dollars into, into those lead kinds of initiatives. Have we looked at anything like that through this? Uh, and if not, can we still? Uh, going forward in, in the next number of months? Uh, through the chair, uh, in fact, in the, in the mayor's task force, that was one of the outcomes and, and uh, results that happened was that uh, they set up a process whereby projects in the downtown got streamlined and had additional staff support to make sure that uh, issues got dealt with. Um, certainly something we can look at. I think the impact is a little uh, less here than in, in say Vancouver and Toronto where you're behind a queue of, uh, of uh, a multitude of projects. Um, so in those instances, it is, it is money uh, by having a sped up process. This market, it tends to happen uh, really in accordance with, uh, with the market pressures as opposed to our process, at least on the major projects. If it's a smaller project, I think that's a different story. But uh, I think that's certainly something that uh, before September we can take a look at and see, uh, you know, what kind of uh, process-related uh, incentives can we offer, and would that make a difference? Okay. Um, just two uh, two quick uh, comments. Uh, very glad to see this notion of uh, of additional parquet land being included uh, in here. Um, while I, I recognize that. Um, you know that's going to create some challenges in, in terms of the removal of the uh, the parkland dedication waiver uh, in, in replace of, by replacing it with a small one. 
Um, I, I think it's going to be necessary to have some small parquets as we intensify in, in various sections. And finally, um, I, I think we can't underestimate the importance of the, uh, the landing pad initiative going forward. Um, I'm not sure if Rod mentioned this. I mean, he talked about the startup growth, but we know that in the last year, we've seen us go from about one startup in this region to two startups in this uh, region a day on average. Uh, and uh, certainly, I think we are c competing with the kinds of cities that, uh, that, 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 that you've referenced. So we want to continue to see this uh, grow our local technology ecosystem. And, and now with the... Um, with, the, with uh, the Kitchener Studio project, the, the digital media um, incubation that can come out of that, I think it's going to be important to, to see that uh, going forward. We've made some really positive steps uh, over the last number of years, and I think we need to keep building on those. So good work, and I look forward to Thank the you. public debate in the coming months. Okay, and if actually the rest of... Uh, certainly. Um, as the rest of the council speaks too, if you'd like to, just for the interest of time, make your comments the same time as your questions, I think that's appropriate. Uh, Councillor Yaneski. Yeah, thank you for your presentation to both of you, and I'm glad to see that this has come forward. As uh, I know we did have these incentives, but I really was curious as to how well they're uh, being taken advantage of, implemented, whether beneficial to the, you know, the industry or not. So this is a good uh, synopsis of what you presented. I appreciate that. However, I do have a number of questions here. Maybe you can help me out. Uh, on uh, page 6 of your report, or 4-13, uh, you, you showed a, the residential condo analysis as to the cost of construction versus the sale price. And uh, you had an average uh, price of uh, what's out in the market in terms of the cost. And it's basically a straight line across the, uh, across the graph whereby the construction cost based on the dollar goes from uh, uh, a bottom left to an upper right in terms of the more cost, the, the more you need to, to uh, have in terms of trying to get your money back to make a profit, otherwise it doesn't deal. But the average line that you've taken is basically being both the lowest and the highest and made it as an average. But wouldn't that line need to be skewed to be in, uh, also in a, in, a, in a right angle, uh, sort of an angle similar to the line there to show whether it is feasible or not? I mean, sure, you may have $200 in terms of cost, but anything over 315 is that what you're saying, that there's the profit? Or really would it be 365 is the profit? Yeah, through, uh, through the chair, um so if you look at the, if for example, the $200 per square foot and you see the blue dot uh, up at the top, uh, basically what, what uh, this says is that in order to be profitable at $200 a square foot, you need to be able to sell your units for $362 a square foot. Uh, so our average is 315 uh, and the highest is 362, uh, which is one Victoria, as I mentioned. So what this suggests to you is that uh, if you can only get the average asking price, you can't make profit. You need to be uh, up near asking what, the, what they're asking at One Victoria, and you have to be able to sell at that rate in order to be profitable at about $200 a foot so of construction what, cost. What they're trying to, going to sell at King and Victoria? Is that, is that the example you're using? Yes. So that's a more high quality building with more uh, bells and whistles to the units. Is that correct, or to the development? That's correct, and uh, in our discussions with them, uh, you know, th they're, even with our incentives, they're right on the line of, of, of meeting their, their profit targets. Um, uh, I, I sh didn't mention in my report, but, uh, you know, we've also seen that uh, there are certain parts of the downtown that can command that price. Clearly, uh, King and Victoria can because of its proximity to the Future Hub, uh, right. the School of Pharmacy, etc. cetera, um, and potentially lands around Victoria Park and maybe Center and the Square could command the close to those prices. Uh, our other parts of our downtown uh, would struggle, I think, to get uh, you know beyond the 315 and push up to that 362 mark. So I think there are only certain areas of the downtown that could uh, that you could, without our involvement, actually build a building at $200 a foot. Okay, so so basically, if you've got the right location and the right product and and, uh, and those benefits, if you can sell it for uh, 365, uh, then it's not an issue. That's correct. Whereby when you go down to 276, 
Well, you have a lower uh, quality building in terms of the amenities, let's say, and, and, and what you put in there, and plus your location may not be the most ideal, you, you still could build that. Uh, through there, yes, you could, you could uh, build it, but yes, the quality and the, the final end product would be uh, significantly less. Uh, you know, to give you an example, buildings built in the 146 to you know 170 mark. Uh, that's typically what you see up on Columbia Street. Uh, so they're big boxes. They might have some cladding on the bottom two floors, and then it's EFIS uh, up to the top. Uh, my own opinion is that's not the type of quality that I think our community is looking for downtown. But that's the kind of building that you could you could potentially build downtown and uh, and potentially be profitable. Okay, I, I, I agree, and there is that potential there. Um, the three-year tax exemption, uh, based on your report, there were no projects that were approved that uh, uh, took benefit of this? I uh, found that as a surprise. I thought there was a few. I don't know. Uh, through the chair, there may have been. Uh, all I could go back to is what was on record uh, really when we started documenting electronically and we didn't uh, find any paper notes. So there may have been ones that probably in the late 90s probably took advantage of this, but certainly in the, from whatever records I could access, I couldn't see any projects that uh, had used it, whether that's we weren't publicizing it very well or, or what the reason was. Uh, we couldn't find any ones. That okay. And I know you're going to be eliminating it, so I don't want to belabor that, but just more curiosity. Uh, the next aspect is the, the building permit uh, rebates. And you're going to be modifying this, as you indicated. Um, what's uh, right, right now? You mentioned there's uh, funding is limited. What is it limited to? What's the, what's the, what's the dollar sign right now? Uh, through the chair, it's not limited per project. It's uh, limited by what's uh, in the capital budget. That, that's what I mean. What is yes. that figure? Uh, we have we probably have uh, about nine hundred thousand uh, dollars in because it's a capital budget, so it accrues. We have about nine hundred thousand uh, available, uh, and there's about eighty thousand that gets put in every year. Um, so uh, you know, at the end of this year, we could have roughly a million dollars. The big projects, they uh, like a one Victoria and city center. Those two projects alone would probably eat up that entire budget. Right. Uh, that's how much those permits are, are cost. So it may seem like a lot of money, but in in fact, it's actually uh, an underfunded uh, program for those types of major developments. So basically, you want to take it and give it to the lower guy who's got the small little development and get his money thousand, two thousand dollars back, whatever. That's where the the intent is. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, Parkland dedication, um, how much money have we lost since 1995 on, on this exemption? Uh, through the chair, I would the have to yeah. go back and look. Um, since 1995, probably not that many. I mean, the, the biggest one would have been that uh, new apartment building at uh, Queen, and Vic Queen and Weber uh, would have been the main contributor, and I think there's roughly 200 units in there. and. Uh, Depending on uh, whether we're asking for the full amount or not, um, so you, you give me two quick seconds. I can potentially tell you. <clears throat> uh, so for a building like that, for example, um, you know the the. The parkland way was about eighteen hundred dollars uh, a unit. Um, that's at the uh, at, a, at a more urban rate. Uh, so eighteen hundred times two hundred units. That's the amount of dollars that we would have lost. Do the math in my head, but three point six million. Monday morning, and yeah. So we so uh, that would probably be the main project. And Le Marche would have been the other one. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to look to see whether Coffin would, uh, because it was a building within existing space, whether that would have. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad this not. is going to be um, uh, eliminated. In that, uh, I mean, we're talking about funding for parks and trails, and then yet we give exemptions on this, and then you want to build, but you don't got no money coming in. So yep. uh, you can't be speaking to both sides of your mouth. You want to uh, make progress on this. I'm glad yep. that's going to change. Yep. Um, exemptions to development charges. And you made your analysis, and I understand where you're coming from on that. The question I have is that there's a component from the city, which is about three grand plus, plus the uh, portion from the region, uh, which is 9,000. 
Um, you're gonna, you, want, you want to modify this. Uh, what's going to happen with the region? Are, are they on board or are they still going to provide it or are they going to follow what the city wants to do? What's their objective? Uh, through the chair, um, we've had discussions with their staff. I would suggest that uh, their planning staff, uh, their intent is to continue to follow what, uh, what we're doing. Uh, I would say their, their, their finance staff you know, are wrestling with the same issues uh, we are. How do you continue to fund it? So I would say that the, the sentiment is not uh, necessarily equal. So we, we do need to continue to engage the region uh, uh, at all levels to, to, to determine what their actual final position would be. I'm sorry, say the last part again? Uh, we clearly sure, need to stay engaged there. because it's not, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not their entire, uh, you know, it hasn't been a direction of council yet. And there hasn't been a decision of their council on which, which way to go. And uh, their staff aren't necessarily entirely in agreement with the way we would proceed. Okay. Um, next one is the upper story renovation program. You said there was, what, $600,000 available? Or, or what? Yeah, that was you. Uh, yeah, uh, through the chair. Uh, when that program was established, I think there was roughly a million dollars that was put into it. And through those six projects, uh, they equated to about uh, four hundred thousand dollars, so there are six hundred thousand that hadn't been uh, spent out of that uh, program yet. So, what's going to happen to that money? Are you going to transfer it to somewhere else? Uh, through the chair, uh, what we've suggested is if we develop a landing pad program, we would okay. use that uh, money to finance that program. So, if you go to the landing pad grant program, and then I'm looking at your overall evaluation, which you had this chart with the, with the S's and nos. Remember yep. that one? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have those six programs, and the land, uh, landing pad program is a new one, which would be a seventh. Right. How does that fit in in terms of easy to administer? Easy or not easy to administer? I, I, yeah. I gather it looked quite complicated. Uh, through the chair, uh, if we offered that program the same way we offered the, offered the upper story renovation program, because they're fairly similar, they're, it's just a different use. It's really both targeted at the second and third floor, floor space. Uh, just instead of residential, we're looking at uh, these landing pads. The way we offer the upper story program was both a, a grant and a loan. Uh, grants are very easy to administer. Loans are extremely time consuming and difficult and costly to uh, administer. Uh, so what we're suggesting is if we uh, developed a landing pad program, we would not include the loan portion of that. We would simply include it as a, as a grant, which uh, uh, is far more easy to administer. The, it's, it would be similar to the facade grant program, which is fairly straightforward to administer. Okay. And my final uh, question pertains to the correspondence from Jennifer Voss from Activa in regard to her concern and comments on the calculation of the park, um, uh, park land uh, cash in lieu and uh, that if you've got X number of units in smaller sizes versus a larger building, even though the same building could be the same, mm -hmm. one, uh, the, the smaller the units, the greater the contribution. Yet the building's still the same. You still got 20 stories, you still got a million square feet, whatever it is, yeah. but you contribute three times as much if you've got three times as many units. Are you gonna be looking at modifying that in terms of a different calculation to balance it out versus large, uh, larger units, which are probably more uh, expensive and, fo and affordable, whereby the other ones are more in, you know, starter uh, level? Uh, through the chair, uh, it's certainly something we can look at through a review, but the Planning Act uh, limits us to the calculation typically has to be per unit and uh, as opposed to, you know, a sliding scale depending on the size of units or the number of units. Uh, uh, but it's certainly something we can look into. I just am not hopeful that we'll have a, the kind of, be the ability to do what you're suggesting. Right. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mayor Zarr. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks for the report. And I, I think that this is probably um, one of the more comprehensive reports that we've uh, had in terms of this issue uh, for, for many, many years. So, and I appreciate your comment as well about uh, so many people that had worked on it. Um, just uh, a few questions. 79 Joseph, that's uh, where Treehouse is now, the old Hydra House, is that correct? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Okay. Um, and if I'm also correct, what is part of the recommendations at this point in time, or the entire set of recommendations, is that 
it is no change to the budget requirements. Is that also correct? Through the chair, that's correct. We aren't, there's, if we, based on what we're suggesting, there would be no additional funding required to, uh, to finance these. We would be using ex existing funds. Okay. Um, next, it, each one of the, um, the incentives, uh, you had some calculations to uh, obviously back up your, your recommendation. I, unless I missed it, I don't see uh, sort of an overall chart that would say what, um, uh, what the cost or, or revenue calculations are for all of this. You were doing it, uh, doing it based right. on a per unit and, a, uh, and an incentive, specific incentive. Right. Is there a summary of that that you did? Uh, through the chair, so if you were to take all of the potential costs to the city for all of these programs, what does that look like? Is that what you're? Yes. Um, or is it basically what is in our budget? That... Through the chair, it's essentially with the exception of uh, the DC waiver, all of the other programs are subject to funding. So whatever's in the budget is all we can spend and we can cap it. Uh, the development charge waiver as it exists today is the one open-ended uh, uh, okay. program where basically, you know, if we don't make changes to the program, Every single time a project comes forward, uh, we have to find a way mm -hmm. to finance those uh, uh, those waivers. So that one, you know, if you were to add up all of the major projects, that could be a significant uh, price tag uh, with with what's in the queue right now. Okay, so that becomes a cost, an additional cost to the city, only if, as, and when we have uh, down pro downtown projects, capital projects that would otherwise have been included in the DC. That's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, and just checking my questions. So on a go-forward basis now, and actually you did uh, speak to part of this uh, with another question when you were talking about the discussion you had with the home builders, but so what have been those discussions and what will be those discussions continuing on between now and September when you come back with this report in, in order to uh, get the public input? Have you planned anything specific, or are you uh, hoping for our views and then also uh, getting some additional comments from the sector or the public in general? Uh, through the chair, uh, with the exception of the, of the discussion with the home builders, uh, which is for scheduling reasons was after this meeting, um, we've essentially completed all of our consultation with stakeholders in the, in the community. Um, not to say that other comments won't come in or uh, we won't receive more, but if we receive more, we'll certainly uh, comment back. We, we made sure to meet with all of the major uh, downtown stakeholders that we thought had uh, uh, an interest, and uh, uh, we've done that. And uh, uh, most of uh, those stakeholders are in agreement with our approach. Uh, and in fact, they, they made the point that if it wasn't for these incentives, the likelihood of them carrying forward with their projects now would be much less probably stating it mildly, they probably wouldn't do them if, if we didn't have these incentives was sort of the, the point they made to me. Um, so beyond, beyond the discussion with the stakeholder, with the uh, home builders, which is uh, essentially to, to, to gauge the, the reaction from typical suburban uh, home builders as opposed to the, the more urban developers that we typically deal yes, with, appreciate uh, that. that's probably about the only outstanding uh, commentary that we'll, we'll receive between then and now. Okay. So, uh, my comments, Mr. Chairman, um, I think you're asking for them both at the same time as questions. Yes. Uh, I am supportive of uh, what is being recommended. I, um, it took me a while to get my head around all of the nuances here, but what I like about it is that um, it does not change the budget requirement, but um, sort of customizes the incentive programs that we do have and customizes the use of the funds that are in our budget to make them more relative to what the, the marketplace uh, is today. And uh, in terms of the, uh, the potential risk in the future, that um, significant downtown projects would have to compete with, uh, or would, uh, would no longer have DC funding, I think that's probably appropriate as well. So it will simply compete with everything else in our capital budget. Um, so it's a level playing field in that respect. So I will be supporting the, the recommendations as they are now. I recognize that today we're not um, asking for, or at least the staff is not asking for 
uh, approval. But as I see it now, my inclination when it comes back would be to be supportive of it. Certainly today I will support the recommendation that is in front of us. Thank you. Councillor Fernandez. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you for this uh, uh, interesting read. I have to say that uh, it was an awful lot to sort of chow through <laughs> and understand, especially with all the different um, incentive programs. I'm sort of going to go s start from the community engagement component mm -hmm. um, first because um, that's always been a, uh, a big issue for me. When I read about the community engagement, um, I, I, I do feel, and, and in reviewing the three letters that we received, uh, I think that you're, when you're talking about interested stakeholders and developers, you're talking about really only um, the people who are here right now building, working in the downtown, um, have businesses. Uh, I think you are missing um, the general public. I think the general public needs to understand because I've heard over and over and over again that we are not paying attention to issues in the suburban areas. We've got all kinds of plazas and I see it so often because when you bike around the community, you see the missing teeth, you see all of the, the gaps. And plazas that are sitting half empty are not an incentive for businesses to come. Mm -hmm. And they're not an incentive for residents to go to those businesses. Not everybody is going to come downtown. And we need to ask our general public, whether it's a budget implication or not. So my question is, how can we engage the general public? They need to understand. I mean, it's their money we're playing with here. Yeah. So, you know, if you're saying September is when you want us to, to support this, I think it's too soon. This process has taken place through the entire summer when a lot of the general public is on holidays. So I would really, I'd like to know sure. how we can engage the, the general public and get their comments. I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, through the chair, um, this is probably in my career the third or fourth time I've gone through it and uh, either brought an incentive program forward um, or done a review. And the nature of this type of work typically gets very little community response, um, whether that's because of the complexity or or what the issue may be. Typically, we don't get a lot of community feedback from the, from the general public. Uh, not saying that's a good thing, that's just what we've experienced uh, uh, today. I think if, I, if what I'm understanding um, from your comment about, you know, if, if I'm understanding right, is you know, should we be considering offering incentives for strip plazas or other areas outside the downtown? Um, uh, and would the residents welcome that or not? Uh, that's a much bigger question, and I think that could be potentially handled through, you know, an upcoming uh, uh, Compass Kitchener survey, for example, if they were to ask a question of, you know, would you support incentives being offered in your in your uh, neighborhood that are geared towards assisting the plaza? We, I think those types of questions are questions we could ask. Um, in terms of getting the general public's uh, input on on these incentives. Uh, you know, there's always things we can do, but we've typically found that, that they just typically don't uh, uh, understand the issues no matter how easy we try to make it, and it becomes challenging to get feedback. So we're certainly open to, to doing that. Um, I should say that every, you know, uh, when we bring projects forward in the implementation stage, all of them are done through, there's a, there's a regimented public process uh, that we have to go through. Uh, we can certainly, through those uh, processes, think of ways to to try to make it understandable for the general public to provide feedback, uh, if if that's the desire. Um, again, I just uh, my history has told me that the, the public generally doesn't get engaged in this kind of a discussion. Sorry, Mr. Aguirre, you want to add? Yeah, just to uh, just to add to Corey's uh, statement, we we have had. Um, uh, questions about the, the importance of the downtown on uh, on our uh, in in our various uh, polling processes, our embryonic surveys, uh, our our uh, 
uh, the Compass Kitchener work, and through all of those processes, the public has very clearly told us that the downtown is a strategic issue for, for the city, that it's important for the city to invest, and we have ver had very strong levels of support for the continued uh, investment that we've made in the, in, in the downtown. I, I would add that the downtown is not just um, uh, another part of the city. It, 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 we have, it's the largest uh, employment area in the city. We have uh, 12, over 12,000 people working in the city. Most of those people uh, live outside in, in suburban areas of the, of, of the community and, um, and commute into work. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a part of the city that serves the entire uh, whole. And I guess the third point I'd like to make is that the, the bulk of the city's capital budget actually does go towards uh, the, uh, the larger project. This is the, the city's um, um, capital funding, and I believe we did some work on this a little while ago. I can't remember the, the exact outcome of this, but it, certainly um, uh, the, the downtown um, is, is not uh, disproportionately uh, served through the, the, the city's uh, capital program at, at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, I, that, that, leads, that begs to another question which I will, will answer after I, my list of other questions. Um, I, I see that the media is here and I'm hoping that the media will, um, will cover this in, in a way that will encourage citizens to come out, whether it's through emails to their councillors or to um, our staff, I think it's very important that they have some kind of input. I think it's not, um, it, it, it bothers me a little bit, gentlemen, when you say typically, and um, I think we're underestimating the um, interest in our community, given what Mr. Greer said with regard to surveys and, and uh, Compass Kitchener. Um, other questions I have is, um, I, I guess in a way, Mr. Greer answered my question about what is the benefit to the average taxpayer who lives outside of the core um, on, the, on the work that's happening in downtown. Do you have another answer outside of what Mr. Greer was talking about with regards to employees that are working in the downtown core? I can see that as a fairly obvious mm -hmm. response. They have a place to, to go for lunch. They have a place to um, see some entertainment while they're working here. But once they leave the downtown core, many of them don't come back. So what? Can you, how would you sell this to the average taxpayer? Just before you start, Mr. Aguirre, do you want to finish your thought on that first? Well, I would just, um, just to respond to that issue I, or that question, I, uh, the downtown is, is, um, is, a, uh, is a resource for the entire city. Uh, just this weekend we saw you know, uh, tens of thousands of people coming into the downtown, filling the streets completely. We see that happening. Uh, for multiple events uh, throughout the course of the year, uh, Cruising on King, uh, our multicultural festival, uh, uh, Word on the Street, our various parades and so on. So the, so the downtown is really a resource for the entire community, in addition to the largest single uh, uh, employment district in, in, in the community. Um, but what we're seeing now is that the, the downtown has become iconic for the, some of the fastest growing uh, components of our, of our economy. Uh, the, are particularly for our startup techno and technology companies. And the downtown, I can tell you, is, is uh, receiving notice um, ar around, you know, across North America as a, as a place for the growth, to support the growth of, uh, of some of the most innovative companies uh, anywhere. Uh, these companies la are laying the foundation for our economy. They're employing our youth. They're employing, uh, they're generating high-value, creative occupations uh, and they're helping us respond as an as a region to the uh, to the challenges in our uh, in our economy as a whole so I think it's a it's a strategic uh, asset for the city and it's having a significant impact on uh, on uh, what kind of a region what kind of economy we're we're uh, we're living in okay thank you for that um, one of the things that I'm uh, was was looking at, and, and this was because I was looking at our budget review, which is the next agenda item, is, um, and given, notwithstanding the fact that Mayor Zayer mentioned that this is no, has no budget implications in terms of where the money is presently coming from, um, 
we are below our assessment growth. And I, I, I guess this is sort of a double-edged sword when I ask this question because if we're below our assessment growth, you would think that I would be saying, great, let's, you know, let's go, let's get some more um, assessment growth in the downtown and do whatever we can. But we are below, we were at 0.7% and Mr. Chapman, correct me if I'm, if I'm incorrect, if it was 0.7 assessment growth at this point, which is about 0.8% less than where we were last year. Um, if we don't see this increased interest in, in building residential properties, um, uh, that we're not going to increase our, our, our assessment growth, therefore we're not going to have the dollars to, to move forward on anything in our budget. Yep. So we're kind of, I kind of see that we're taking with one hand and, 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 and giving with another on something that may not come to fruition. Some of these incentives didn't work. How are you believing that some of these other going? I mean, you're talking mainly, mainly incentives for business, but the incentives, I guess, that we would sh want to see would be ones that would increase our assessment growth yeah. and rentals and, sure. and condos and such. Sorry, Councilor Fernandez, can I just get you to, well, first, just to be clear as well, last year our assessment growth was 0.6 higher than our projections, is what, so which is significant. It was about my numbers I, that I have. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just saying that um, the assessment projection now isn't really entirely focused. When, it, like, by the end of the year, like we're targeting one percent, and there's a very high likelihood by the end of the year we'll be closer to that one percent. I um, understand. But if you could just, sorry, I don't really understand the question. Though, if you could just rephrase, the understanding what the the tie-in is. I think I think Corey understood. He was okay. nodding. Do you, okay, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I, the way I would answer it is. Um, uh, whether it's a f true cost or foregone revenue, we don't actually experience that until uh, building permit time when the actual permits are issued. So as long as nothing happens, it's not a cost. Um, and then I would, in terms of, of growth, uh, you know, I'd revert back to that one chart I showed you, uh, which basically suggests for the value of an incentive that we're talking about here, um, you know, once you're beyond, say, six years of post-occupancy, so that building has existed for six years, uh, that's brand new tax assessment that doesn't uh, exist today, um, and in fact, you have you basically have from occupancy on uh, that you would have new tax assessment. But as I said, there's a, sort of that six-year window where it'll take you that long to recoup what was given out through an incentive. So, uh, you know, if you took a 20-year perspective and uh, uh, you had significant development growth, yes, there's going to be a five or six-year window where uh, technically you're not really gaining any ground, but beyond that six years, you've got a lifetime of, uh, uh, of new assessment to, uh, to, to fit in the budget. So I don't know if that answers your Yes, it kind of does, but I, I guess you're sort of helping me um, form a, my question with regard to how long it's going to take for, for some of this payback, which, which is six years and some 5.37 and others. Um, is that the general standard of, of payback? I mean, I, mean I, I guess that's really a difficult question to answer. But, but if it, you're looking at other city, cities yeah. comparatively to other municipalities that are roughly the size that we are, is uh, incentive programs paying back quicker or longer? Uh, through the chair, yeah, it, it really depends on different communities. Um, Brantford, for example, they offer significantly more in terms of incentives than we do, and they probably have a much smaller post-development assessment. So for them, there's a, a the payback is is probably far more significant than than ours. Um, I would say most cities are like London and and uh, you know cities of our size. It's probably going to be comparable in terms of uh, uh, the amount of incentive they're offering relative to the amount of assessment growth uh, uh, they would expect to get. Um, it's just so then it becomes a question is, you know, is six years uh, a good, good number of, uh, of time before you really see, uh, you know, a true uh, return, I guess, on the investment, if you want to call it that. Okay, thank you. Um, going to the parkland uh, dedication and, and having sat on the Kitchener Environmental Committee, I remember very distinctly one of the um, action uh, points that that, and, and requests that came out of the air quality report was 
to actually increase the parkland education um, that you know two percent for businesses was was pretty low mm -hmm. uh, and and just going to what Councillor Yanetsky was saying you know why are we not um, you know per unit if the building mass is the same you know some are paying higher and I, I, I would suggest to Councillor Yanetsky that it's because there are more people and the more people really equals really what more green space we need. As we intensify, my understanding is that we really need more green space. So I would really not support a reduction in parkland dedication. I think that um, the, the pressure on Victoria Park, um, it's, it's an amazing area, but we, it, a, a park cannot, parkette does not fulfill the, the need for people who are living in an apartment building uh, or a condo development. So. I don't understand why we would reduce it. I think it's really yeah. much more important to at least stay the course in terms of a 2%. Uh, through the chair, and again, we didn't get into detail in this report, but I suspect if when, you know, when we come back with a more comprehensive review of the parkland education policy, um, if we were to ask for the full amount that uh, the Planning Act allows us, um, depending on, and it, it varies depending on the value of the land, which is sort of what it's all contingent upon, uh, that could escalate upwards of eight or nine thousand dollars per unit, which would essentially have the effect of, you know, negating any other incentives we're offering. So it, it could come as an encumbrance and actually prohibit development if we asked for the full amount that we're allowed to ask for. So I think what we're uh, trying to determine is What's an appropriate uh, rate of 100% is probably going to stifle development? What's the right percentage for these projects that we can collect some money, but we're still not stifling development? And that's, uh, that's the challenge. So I think you know, we'll do much more uh, detailed work on that as we were to bring that forward. Uh, we've suggested that a 0.15, uh, sort of 15% uh, makes sense, but uh, we'll do a much more uh, comprehensive analysis on that uh, when we bring that forward. Okay, just, I, just to clarify, if I could as well, but right now we're collecting zero. Right. Okay, so we are actually increasing it. I just when you said stay the course. I wanted to make sure you understood the the recommend well not the recommendation but the in this this plan here if we do end up doing it would be increasing it to fifteen percent of what we would otherwise do. That's correct. So I, I guess I'm a little bit okay. confused. My understanding was that we collected two percent uh, no. through the chair, not downtown. Downtown right now we don't zero. collect anything. So we're suggesting we actually would add a, uh, uh, we'd, we'd actually collect money moving forward. So it's a question of what's that, what's that amount. Okay, okay. Well, I, I appreciate that because I think that's really um, crucial to, I think any study that you would, you would read regarding the quality of life for people who are living in intensification, intensive buildings with no green space, yeah. except for maybe a balcony pot, um, they, they really need to be out and have the ability to connect in trails and parks and such. Yep. Um, okay, um, I'm just a little bit concerned, and, and may help me understand. Um, you were talking about the pre-2009, uh, and, you, and my, I wrote down here: cut a hole in the bylaw. Developers don't pay development charge fee, um, which I think is a little bit risky if it means that we won't have money for future capital projects. We're always hearing that our infrastructure is crumbling. We need to, I mean, Margaret yeah. Avenue Bridge is a perfect example. If we don't, that's a downtown yeah. bridge. If we don't have the money to fix those kind of things because we're not collecting DC charges from downtown development or any development within the downtown core, um, where are we going to get the money? Yeah. Uh, through the chair, I just want to clarify that uh, you can only go to the development charge fund for growth related capital projects. So maintenance typically, so just to resurface a road or fix a bridge that's aging, typically has to come out of the capital budget as opposed to the development charge budget. So it's really just infrastructure improvements to accommodate you know, intensification, for example. Um, so you know, in, in our look forward over the next uh, you know, term of the bylaw, uh, we don't see many growth-related infrastructure needs in the downtown. Not to say that there won't be maintenance needs, perhaps, but uh, not any growth-related, just to clarify. Okay. Thanks, for help. Thanks for helping me understand that a bit better. Um, 
I'm just holding off on, on talking about the la landing pad issue because I, I do feel that that requires a few more minutes of, of everybody's time. Um, what, if we can put a number on what we have been doing in terms of all of these incentives, do we have a sort of a total budget? You know, Mayor Zayer said it has no budget ramifications because we're, we're shifting monies from programs that we've used in the past. And maybe I missed it in the report. I, I apologize if I did. Uh, what's the total n dollars that we've been using for these programs or spent out for these programs that we're now going to be shifting? Is there is there a ability to put... Uh, through the chair, yes, we could uh, calculate that. I can give you a rough idea that uh, uh, facade grant program, for example, that was a one-time uh, set of funding for $600,000, so we expect by the end of this year that that would be uh, uh, exhausted. Uh, uh, and just for some context, uh, that leveraged about uh, you know 1.8 million in private sector dollars, so pretty much our dollar was only a quarter of the full full amount. But that program was $600,000. Um, the building permit rebate, again, it's, it's, a, it's a capital line item that's about $80,000 uh, a year, uh, and it, it accrues. So that, it's a little harder because we don't, it, it really gets exhausted as a big project comes forward. Um, so it's not like we see an, a similar amount of of money being paid out of that uh, every year. Hey, Corey, I'm going to interrupt you because I, 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 I see where you're, you're, you're having to try and, and juggle all of this. Yeah. So I, maybe it would be better if you could uh, sure. send something to council yep. uh, because you've got a, a per year cost here and then you've got a, an, an, an overall budget and um, it's gonna, I don't want to waste your time yep. and council's time on that. So if sure. you can send that to us, that would probably be a lot better. Um, going to the landing pad. Um, Given the information that you know, Mr. Gregier has given us, and, and you know the the uh, excitement about us being such a great startup city and Communitech and such forth, uh, interesting conversation I had with somebody who started up a company not that long ago, um, who continues to struggle uh, just as a startup, and, and they're and they're in fairly decent space and they're low, they're accessible. I'm re really concerned with the concept of us giving uh, a 50% grant. Uh, I think that's significant dollars in uh, investing in businesses that we're not sure are, are going to survive. Um, right now we're looking at an 8% unemployment rate, mm -hmm. which if we're having all of these incentives and all, I'm sorry, all these startups and all these new mm -hmm. businesses that are starting up every single day, then why are we faced with an 8% um, unemployment rate? So I, I think that, um, although I, I understand the philosophy, I'm, I think that we're looking at quite a significant dollar to mm -hmm. uh, start up these, these, starting, these startups. My question is, sorry, um, where, where would the, again, where would the general public or the general taxpayer see a benefit to these landing pads? Yes, they, they, could, they could employ some people, they could maybe help reduce that in unemployment rate, but... Mr. Rigger? Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, um, th three years ago, uh, Vidyard was, um, was, were, was a, was a an idea of uh, two students uh, from uh, University of Waterloo. Um, we supported them through the Waterloo Region Small Business Center, through the Community Tech Program. They went to California. They received uh, um, some uh, Series A funding from uh, key investors in California. Today, they're, uh, they're over 30 employees uh, and uh, growing exponential, exponentially, and uh, I understand they've got a million users of their technology online. Um, we see uh, startups like uh, like Kick um, uh, growing exponentially. We see uh, companies like Thalmic Labs, which was a um, a startup out of the University of Water Waterloo Velocity program at uh, the Communitech Hub. Um, again, two or three uh, students uh, 
uh, engineering students from the university. Today they're, uh, they're 25 or 30 going to 75 by the end of the year. So these are companies which are doubling their employment every uh, six months, every, every 12 months right now. Um, this is where uh, BlackBerry was in the early 1990s. This is where uh, at one time uh, uh, Manulife would have been or Electrohome. So what we're funding here are the uh, embryos of companies that can become major employers and major tax generators for our community. The long-term benefits of having one of the most exciting uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems in, uh, in the country is that we will continue to generate growth and employment and uh, future tax revenue um, uh, at, you know, at, uh, at sustainable rates into the future. Uh, this is really the uh, foundation of uh, the renewal of our, uh, of our economy. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And I guess I, um, you've eliminated another question for me, but I, I guess I'll go to my comments. Uh, I know, realize that I've commented throughout with my questions, and I appreciate that. You know, I, the companies that you mentioned, RIM and Electrohome and Kunz Electroplating, all of those companies built their business on what the market would bear and, and, and how the market would grow. I don't know, and maybe you know, if they had incentives. Um, I don't know that it's, it's necessarily a good thing for, all, for us to always incent businesses. I think sometimes we have to let businesses fail because the market will not bear that particular product or that item or whatever. That's, that's, that's the competitive nature of, of, of business. Uh, if we continue to babysit some of these, um, some of them may hang on for much, much longer than they would because they're getting an incentive program. I, I, I do str really struggle with a 50% um, incentive. I think that's really, really dangerous. So I would definitely not support that component. Um, I'm not even sure that I would support a, a whole landing pad um, incentive period, uh, but I realize that there seems to be quite an appetite around the council chambers to do that. Uh, I guess that would remain to see. Are we, my question I guess is leading to a question instead, are we uh, expected to vote on that component today or just to have you continue, according to this, consider expecting the community improvement plan boundary to include, um, sorry, that was that's out of context. Um, develop a grant program for the landing pad geared towards a startup business. So this is part of what, what you're rec wanting us to approve today. Uh, through the chair, in September, we would be coming back. Based on the, the, the various comments, we'll come back. We'll revise this list of recommendations accordingly. And in September, you'd be giving us, you'd be approving these, but that's really just giving us direction. Uh, to start the process of developing a community improvement plan, which requires uh, at least one more council approval, if not multiple ones, uh, and it requires public engagement and everything else. So you're just really giving us direction to explore it. The final two, for example, even with the process, it would be probably after Christmas before we would actually be able to have a program ready for you guys to actually approve or not approve. So there's still a significant uh, time to go. I might add just one point of clarification, because um, I know it's not explicitly clear. What we're talking about investing in is the physical space more so than the actual business. While the business is part of it, it's really money to go into the renovation of uh, upper story space. And part of uh, the discussions we've had is making sure that those renovations happen in such a way that if that company only lasts six months, two years, three years, uh, that it's suitable for another company to come in uh, after the fact. Uh, so we see it more as an ability to uh, facilitate the renovation of upper story space, which you know, we've, we've seen a history of fires that you know, can take it from worrisome state to uh, state that hopefully whether that company succeeds or not is available to another company. Okay. I thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. That's, um, that's very important. Um, okay. That's all my comments right now, and thank you. we'll go from there. Thanks. Councillor Glenn Graham. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, uh, I do appreciate the hard work and uh, the, that this is um, the first 
opportunity for feedback. Uh, I want to ask about the upper story program and about accessibility and uh, see the chief here as well, about the fire code, um, about our review of that because we, we need to get it right. If we're going to do this, go down this path, uh, I know that these are difficult spaces, but we, I want to make sure that we're looking at it holistically. So can you respond to that? Uh, sure, through the, through the chair. Um, if not for our upper story loan program that we offered, those six projects probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have, wouldn't have gone ahead. Uh, it, was, it was those projects that motivated the building owners to say, I can take these upper floors that uh, most of which were sitting vacant and uh, uh, to actually turn them into you know, uh, new units that are to the standard of the code of, of that time. Uh, so certainly, I mean, we, we, I think we just got to a point with that program where we realized that uh, there wasn't interest from the existing building owners uh, for residential. Um, so this is another opportunity to look at a, the same kind of concept, but with a different use. Um, I think it's one of those things that we can always uh, revisit. Uh, one of the options is we, we don't necessarily need to uh, eliminate the upper story program. We can just provide no funding to it and it basically sits dormant, but we could, if we saw a demand and if, if it was council's appetite to, to to do that again, it's just a matter of finding the funding uh, for that. So that is an option that we could carry forward. I mean, I'm certainly very supportive of the landing pad concept. I, I just want to make sure that we have looked at these kinds of elements of it. In terms of the um, $3.5 million in the, the total pot, how much is committed uh, or either on stream or future projects? Uh, give me one second. Uh, through the chair, um, a good portion of that is committed for sort of, for example, the, the, there's 1.5 million set aside to fund the development charge uh, waivers. Uh, a portion of that is committed through the development agreement with city center. Uh, beyond that, nothing is committed because we don't actually have any developments in place. Uh, if we were to uh, say we're no longer going to offer those uh, exemptions ever again, and we started that today, for example, then uh, it wouldn't cost us anything, but we would have a lot of developers that would probably not be very happy and would probably walk away from their projects. So there's that inherent risk. Um, and uh, so beyond that, I think the other, uh, uh, with the exception of the facade program, which is fully uh, allocated, all of the other programs are of that sort of nature. There's money sitting there. We know there are projects that uh, they've made their decisions to go ahead based on those being available. Um, so if we were to take those away, then we would have to deal with the ramifications of that. No, I'm, I'm certainly not looking to take anything away. I just wanted to see if uh, there was any consideration given for the, that envelope to accommodate a larger fusion building kind of project. Right. And uh, just moving to that topic, um, on 439 to 442, I think. Um, it, it talks about the potential business case for that and a payback that would be, I'm not sure of the price per unit, but about three to 4.5 years uh, for payback with a potential of about 518,000 a year of revenue to the city, um, certainly after that. And you, you talked about the business case yourself, Corey, about the return on investment after the, uh, the city ret recoups its investment. Um, so if you could speak to that today and then briefly, uh, and perhaps bring something back in writing about the business case on the number of units, the investment of the city in total, the payback, and because I think moving, expanding the boundary to the East End makes sense, not only for the potential for this development, but the indirect benefits that it brings to the East End uh, mm -hmm. for generating confidence in that area, also the market, and elevating the value of properties in that whole area. Uh, so through the chairs, so what I'm understanding is, uh, the, if I were to take down to Betzner and look at the, basically the six blocks that are included, um, suggest what, if, what a full build out would look like, what the assessment would look like on that, and then what the 
you know, assuming that those were all built with this sort of incentive model, what the cost is to the city. Thank you. I mean, okay. really, Fusion Homes is, is the one concrete example on the table we, that we have, and I think that's, that's the one that bears looking at very seriously because okay. it does potentially anchor the East End that really could use that investment. So I, I really appreciate that coming okay. back. I don't expect you would have all, all that now, but I really think that it bears looking at it in, in serious detail. Okay. Um, and just briefly as a comment, I do believe in the direction we're going in. I do think that there were, we're really supporting uh, the, the, the current investment of the downtown is paying off. And I think the, the way to support not only our investment in, in creating jobs, but also the, the confidence in the city as a whole is to continue with, in this direction. I do agree with a holistic re review of all our incentives, though as Councillor Fernandez suggested. I do think the downtown still needs incentives, and I think post-LRT would be a perfect opportunity to review them three years out. In terms of the, the landing pad itself, I, I don't think that uh, it's something that could be sustained without the investment. And um, right now, I think that the, the conclusion we have to draw is that these small businesses are the ones that are looking for space. As you said, Corey, we're not, these incentives are not going directly to the businesses. They're going to create the right conditions for success. And I think that's the role of, of our government at this level, is to, to continue to create the right conditions for prosperity. And I think that this is certainly supportive of that. So I would support uh, the whole package we're looking at, with the exception of potentially looking at expanding the boundary in the, the east end of, of the city to, as uh, Fusion suggested, to the, the Betzner area, but that's discussion for a later day. Thank you. Uh, just back to Councillor Fernandez for a uh, finish of thought. Thank you. Th I appreciate your indulgence. Um, I, I probably should have been a little bit clearer on my uh, request for the information about the budget and what, what was being spent. Okay. Um, if you can uh, explain to us or show us what was maybe spent in, in this budget of 2013 and what's expected in the budget for these, had these programs maybe moved forward, um, it, still, it would still be the same amount, however we shift the, the funding. So I just okay. want to make sure that that was... Uh, a little bit clearer for you. And the other was a request that maybe we not um, see this in September, but maybe push it a little bit into October so that should there be any input coming in from the general public, mm -hmm. um, that we allow that to happen. Sure. Thank you. Councillor Gazzola. I have a number of questions, but I'll try to be quick because I guess we're quite a bit over already. Appreciate it. Uh, the, uh, I want to expand on those two things too. I would like to see, I would like to see a summary for the last 15 years of what we have spent on incentive programs. I think that's something that we should have in front of us as we move forward so we can compare to see where we have been. And also, I'm also concerned about, about the September timelines. Uh, th th this is, this, this is pretty uh, involved, and uh, I'm hearing here that the public don't understand the issues here, and I think they need to because uh, the bottom line is the money is coming from where? It's not, not coming from heaven. The mm -hmm. bottom line is the, pub the money is coming from the public, and the public, if, if, if they don't understand, we haven't done a very good job of explaining where we're going, and we need to do that in the next few months before we finalize all these things. So, I wanted to, if you could switch your screen there to what's on page 12, I really want to try to understand who gets the benefits of, of all of these things. And you had a, you had a schedule there, the um, comparison Sorry, Councillor Gazzola, page 12 in the page 12 of the report. Yeah, page, or page 12 or page 419 or 419 or whatever. The, the, <coughs> what I'm trying to drive at is some of these benefits go directly to 
like this three-year tax, ex tax exemption, does that go to the, to the, la the person that owns the unit? Uh, through the chair, typically, it can go either way, but typically it goes to the developer. So the, um, so for example, the person who buys the unit pays the taxes over those three years. Uh, that money, though, uh, we collect it and then we essentially give it as a grant to the developer. Uh, oh, okay. I haven't so, seen it in a case where they would actually give the benefit to the purchaser. Okay, so let, I'll leave it at that. Most of these, most of these benefits, the cash, cash flows to the developer. Doesn't the the uh, homeowner doesn't really see any of this uh, directly up front. Okay. Um, one of the questions is: Does uh, do you know of any uh, any municipality that allows a full parkland? Uh, benefit uh, the, as in a, a full uh, waiver or a full asking the full rate no that allows the full amount as allowed by the planning act uh, through the chair uh, in, an, in an urban downtown context uh, I, again don't quote me on this I don't know the exact answer but uh, from what I understand only the major GTA uh, municipalities uh, are asking the full amount so Toronto for example and Mississauga um, again I don't know if this is exactly the case, but I've heard that Oakville uses it actually as an intensification deterrent. So they actually apply the full rate because they don't want to see more uh, big scale development in their uh, court. Whether that's the case or not, that's just what I heard from a, okay. from a colleague. Um, but by and large, most, I would guess, if I, if I looked into it, most municipalities offer partial, if not full waiver of their uh, parkland fees in mm -hmm. the downtown if they've got an incentive program like ours. Okay. Uh, when you're preparing that summary of the incentives that we have paid out, will you include in that uh, what incentives that we gave to the city center? Yes, we can. Um, I just I want to try to get a, a, a good understanding here of uh, on the DC funding. If we go in the direction that you're uh, Recommending, uh, who, who's who's finally paying the bill for the, for this stuff? Uh, through the chair, um, essentially nobody is paying the bill. Uh, the risk for us is that if there is a growth-related expense that we have to pay for in the next uh, term of that bylaw. Uh, that has to come from the capital budget as opposed to the development charge budget. So in, in essence, it's the taxpayer paying for it as opposed to the developer paying for it, if yeah. that makes sense. Yes, it is the taxpayer. That's where it always comes down to the taxpayer. Uh, just on that, you, you often talk about things that come from the region. They're, they're free. Well, they really come from yes. the other taxpayer's pocket, right? So, so they're, not, they're not free. We need to understand that. Through the chair, yes, I would never refer to that as a free... Uh... No, but you sort of indicate that, you know, yes. we don't have to worry about that. That comes from the region. <laughs> we get a lot of things from the region. Uh, one of the questions I had is, where can I get some objective information about our startups? I hear a lot of information, a lot of information, which I would call more marketing than really objective information. How do we, where, where can one really find, if they wanted to dig into it, you know, what is the real impact of, of our startups? Mr. Aguirre? Uh, Communitech uh, released a, um, a, a study by KPMG this, uh, this spring uh, outlining the economic impact of its, uh, of its work at the Communitech Hub, and uh, we can forward you the link to that study. Fine, thank you. Okay, I, I don't have, uh, I have a number of other questions, but uh, I think that they'll, they'll come out over time. Uh, I am concerned about, about public engagement. We had a public information meeting in, on July the 17th, right dead in the middle of the summer. Because let's face it, the bottom line on all of this is the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. There's no... There's no gray-haired grandfather out there paying the bill. It's a taxpayer. 
I will, uh, I'm not prepared to support anything of where we're going, uh, where staff is looking at. I was, I'm prepared to look at the, uh, that the uh, alternative number five that says that we get out of the incentive business. And I, I, I do it for a number of reasons. I think, uh, I mean, you started right off, right off the fact by saying, uh, the down, our community, the downtown, is different from 19, today from 1995. There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So we've done a great deal in the downtown, and we've spent a lot of money in the downtown. I'm especially concerned about DC funds. We're in bad shape with our DC funds. And the more fiddling we do with this, the worse shape we're going to be in. I would have, you know, in dealing with this, if the DC funds are going to be an integral part of it, uh, if you take your direction from me, they won't be, but, but if that's the choice that you go, we need to know the exact picture of our DC funds because they're currently in, in, in bad shape. We're in the process of we're going to have to be going out, you know, to, out next year with, with new figures, we need to have some good concept of what those figures are. So that's one of the reasons I think it's, you know, it's time that we, we, we got away from this. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is, whatever we do with the DC, the DC funds are intended for the new people coming to town to pay, to enter, to get into partnership with us. And, and uh, you know, this is not happening. This is. We're throwing the bill back to the old people that have been here for 50 years paying their taxes. So we, we have to have a good look at that. Uh, we, we have spent huge amounts of money in the downtown in the last 15 years. When I look around the city, you know, and the downtown is important. There's no, there's no question it's important. It's the base. But, you know, we have to start spending some money on the other rooms in the house too. And I, when, I, when I see, when I hear uh, incidents where there are things that we should be doing as a municipality, we keep saying, we don't have the budget, we can't afford it. And yet we're spending, spending in the downtown. I mean, the downtown is part of the city. It's an important part of the city. Yes, we all converge in the downtown from time to time, but the, the, there's a lot to this city. I, the ward that I represent when it comes to even forgetting residential, for dealing on a commercial basis, the ward that I represent, there is a humongous amount of assessment, commercial, industrial assessment that comes into this, into this city. When I, look at, uh, when I look at the Fairview area, when I look down now in, in the in the area at Deer Ridge on Highway 8, there's a substantial amount of, of, of new assessment coming into the city without any incentives. They've had to do that. Uh, when I look around the city, I look at the, at the Belmont area, for example, another large area, a lot of commerce in the city. Again, it's being done without, without all these incentives. So, when it comes to the landing pad, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Great ideas. The problem is, municipalities don't have the tax base that senior governments have. They, these, these really, this sort of thing comes under the mandate of our federal and provincial governments, they should be taking a much greater lead in this than, than, uh, than we're, you know, we're, trying, we're, we're stepping in as we did with, uh, in so many cases with education, which isn't our mandate, and we're forking out the bill. And that's all coming back to our taxpayers. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the other concerns that I have, and we're gonna start to see the impact of this, is, is very shortly, there's going to be quite an impact on the people that currently work at Schneider's. 
I get emails, and I'm sure you all do from time to time, about what are we doing for those people? I've, heard, I've had several of them write and say, are you going to give me $40,000 to get started up into something now? Yeah, I, think, you know, I think we know what the answer is. So, I, uh, uh, in, in conclusion, I think you, you've done an excellent job in uh, putting all the facts on the table. Uh, you've, done a, you've done a lot of homework. You've done a lot of, uh, prepared a lot of information, which uh, even begs sometimes more information. And I think it's good that we, we look at this, but I think the time has come that we have to start looking, looking away from it and, 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 and counting on the fruits of our past labor to move things forward. And I think, I think you, you said right from the start, it's a different city. So the fruits from our past labor are paying off. I think we've got to rely more on that than uh, continuing with, this, with these incentive programs. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I, just, I have uh, just two questions questions, many of them have talked about in EDAC. Um, with respect to the LRT, when this comes back, assuming that the, um, st uh, the stimulus that comes from the LRT implementation, that some of these incentives are no longer required, is the plan that these incentives can be yanked at a, by a future council or on relatively short notice? Uh, to the chair, I think the intent is we will uh, re review, do this, this ex same exact uh, analysis, um, probably leading up to the end of the next uh, development charge uh, bylaw period, so probably in about four years from now. Uh, and certainly that's uh, the, the thought process of staff is that uh, you know, we would review whether we think we need these incentives or not, uh, much like we did in this case, re review the economics and determine are we ready to. Uh, uh, to fully get out of the incentive business uh, or not. So that is the intent. Uh, again, can't foresee what the, what the answer is, but we'll certainly be studying it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and on the, the landing pad, now, without, now, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I, the way I foresee it working then is it wouldn't actually, I'm not sure how you actually tie the startup business in because the agreement would have to be with the owner of the space that they go in. So my concern is how you're going to tie the actual startup business, and I guess uh, I'm worried about it being an end run for um, private landlords to get their places renovated and then end up not getting startups in there. How can we get around that? Uh, through the chair, again, those are uh, details that we're still uh, working through, but um, in essence, uh, we would have an agreement with the building owner that they could only rent to businesses which satisfy certain criteria, and that we would withhold uh, portions of that grant. Uh, for example, if we had a five-year window, we'd want to make sure that over that, the next five years that was used for startups, then we don't give them all of the money until that has been uh, satisfied. So that is the, the thought process, but we, don't, we haven't exactly worked out what that mechanics is, but there would be some, some leverage that we have to make sure that those uh, spaces are used for the intended uh, users. Okay. Uh, Commenting briefly, I, I agree, I don't think, especially in light of recent reports about unemployment in the region, I don't think now is the time to cut back on incentives. I, I wouldn't be in support if there was any sort of budget impact. The fact that it's revenue neutral, um, I think is appropriate. I do think there is going to be a time in the not too distant future when um, the rapid transit implementation should, by all accounts, uh, help in our ability to remove these incentives and possibly um, reprioritize the dollars to places that we could use them uh, elsewhere in the city. Um, sensitive to the fact, obviously, that uh, the downtown has received significant uh, investment compared to the outlying parts of the city, and I look forward to the day when um, the engine downtown starts um, operating itself. I don't think that time is just yet. I think it's in the very near future that we need to start clawing back those incentives, uh, but I'm very happy to see this before us. Uh, in particular, I, while there's still some details to be worked out, I think the landing pad idea is great because if there's one thing that's, that's frustrating for all the work that we do with startups, uh, it's right at the point when they start to become viable, sustainable, that's when they often decide to leave the region and it's because there isn't a program like this in place. So um, 
there'll be some challenges in terms of marketing, in terms of getting this information out there to the potential startups, but I think it's, I think it's a very good uh, starting program. So, Councillor Verbanovich, you moved it. Do you want to comment? <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> if I can, uh, Mr. Chair, just move it and, and just make a, a couple comments because I think they are uh, important to make. And, and in moving the recommendation, um, I, I think the direction that staff have received has been the, the comments that a number of councillors have made of additional information that we'd like to see. Um, and also uh, the fact that uh, we, we think it's appropriate to take a little bit of additional time in consulting with the public uh, and bringing the report back. Um, quite frankly, uh, I don't think it, needs, it means anything in terms of uh, uh, the timing of the report or as it's indicated in the recommendation because it refers to fall of 2013 and technically that takes us to December 21st. So I think that gives staff lots of latitude to, to do the consultation uh, and, uh, and come back. I think what's important to remember today is that we aren't approving anything. This is purely a draft report uh, that's going to initi initiate further dialogue with, uh, with the community. Um, you know, I think it's also important to, to remember that as we talk about this, this isn't about, uh, this isn't about talking about programs that are choosing downtown versus uh, suburbia. Um, yes, without a question, there's been significant investments in the, in, made in the downtown, but there have also been significant investments made uh, in suburbia. Uh, new community centers like Kingsdale and Stanley Park, the Activa Sportsplex, facilities like McLennan Park, new libraries in, in Country Hills and Stanley Park, infrastructure improvements, the CMF, which largely serves suburban neighborhoods and, and the downtown neighborhoods as well. All of these are other investments that the city has made, substantive investments, um, in, in our community. I think the, the reality is if we don't see a strong downtown, we will begin to see increasingly weaker suburban neighborhoods throughout the city. And I've often likened the downtown to the foundation of a home when if you don't fix some of those cracks as we have done, the home eventually begins to crumble. And if we didn't address those downtown challenges, our suburbs, I believe, would be a lot worse off today than, uh, than they are. And similar, if we don't solidify some of the gains we have made, and I think uh, Chair Davey is, is right, we're not just quite there yet, we run the risk of falling behind again. Yes, at the end of the day, all of this uh, means it's taxpayer funded, but in many cases this new development is development with, uh, which otherwise wouldn't uh, have happened, and development which has helped create new revenues which ultimately eliminate other budgetary challenges uh, on our budget that impact all of our residents as well. So I look forward to the, uh, the public input over the next uh, number of months uh, and uh, I think uh, we're on, uh, on the right track certainly in terms of uh, getting uh, further input uh, from the public in terms of where we go with this later in the fall. Thank you. Recorded vote has been called. And that passes. Uh, Councillor Gazzola, I have you. Is that a mistake? Or? I wonder why Councillor Berbanovic got to speak twice. Why, why? That doesn't seem quite. Uh, yeah, yeah he, he was moving the motion, and to be fair to you, I let Councillor Fernandez. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, to be fair to you, I let Councillor Fernandez finish her thought as well. So, Okay, um, I know we're, we're actually almost an hour behind here, but we are going to take a quick two minute stretch, folks. Um, please make it two minutes, okay? Thank you.
Okay, Mr. Hagee. Hello, Chair Davey, members of Council. I'm pleased to be here to talk about the 2014 budget process. Uh, today we'll be going over, uh, I have a brief presentation with the five following sections. They follow the same sections as we find in the report. And a lot of what I'm addressing in my uh, speaking notes deals with content included in the report. The first area that we'll look at is, is budget context. And over the last few budget cycles, the overall message that we've heard from the community is noted at the top point of this slide. The community is looking for tax rate increases that approximate inflation while maintaining existing service levels. And this message is well aligned with Council's policy for setting tax rate increases, which we'll look at over the next few slides. As a reminder, Council has approved strategic, strategic directions for financial management that say that we should look at three factors when setting tax rate increases. Comparison with other municipalities, inflationary increases, and citizens' willingness to, uh, to pay for services and what uh, level of service they would want. And we'll just flesh that out in a little more detail over the next few slides. So first, looking at comparison with other municipalities. The graph before you shows the city of Kitchener's relative tax burden to other large municipalities in Ontario. And Council has seen this graph a number of times before. As you can see, the city of Kitchener is the orange bar and is fifth lowest of large municipalities in Ontario and is well below the average, which is about halfway or a little bit to the right of halfway in the yellow bar shown on the screen. The city of Kitchener is also lowest in the region with Cambridge being sixth lowest and Waterloo being 11th lowest. All this is to say that the city of Kitchener has a low relative tax burden compared with other municipalities, large municipalities in Ontario. Turning our attention locally, tax increases for 2013 that were approved uh, in large municipalities in the region show that the city of Kitchener had the lowest tax rate increase of any of those municipalities, lower than Cambridge, lower than Waterloo, and lower than the region. And based on published information on the 2014 budget, the city of Kitchener is pegged to have the lowest tax rate increase of those same municipalities. All this, again, is to say that the city of Kitchener compares favorably with other municipalities regionally as well across the province. Second factor to consider is inflation. And as shown in the chart here, uh, uh, there are a number of inflation factors to consider. The federal and provincial governments have included forecasts for inflation in 2013 of 1.5 and 1.3 percent respectively whereas uh, their forecasts in future years are 2% for 2014, 15, and 16. The most recent actual CPI number for, uh, uh, for Ontario was 1.3%, and the cumulative average over the first half of the year was 0.8%. As noted on the bottom of the slide, the city also calculates MPI, the Municipal Price Index, and that equates uh, the impacts of inflation on, uh, on our municipality. Over the last two years, MPI has been a quarter of a percent higher than CPI, which means that the city is more susceptible to inflation impacts than a local average consumer. Finally, looking at service levels versus affordability, this is the third and final factor to consider. During the 2013 budget process, the city conducted a survey where 62% of respondents said that they prefer tax rate increase that it approximates inflation and maintains existing service levels. The finding of this far outweighs the other options and is consistent with the result uh, from a 2009 study uh, conducted by Enveronix. So that's all the budget context uh, leading into the process. Now we'll, we'll look at uh, major factors affecting the 2014 budget. We're just going to deal with some of the major ones, not getting into all the, the nitty gritty of every single one, but first off is fire arbitration. And as Council is aware, fire services is the single most expensive uh, cost element of the tax supported budget, and the majority of those costs relate to compensation. Firefighters are currently without contract and are in a binding arbitration process that will see an arbitrator set the compensation increase for that bargaining unit. Based on past experience, looking at other municipalities and in recent times, the arbitrated settlements having been higher than inflation, so this is causing upward pressure on the tax rate increase for 2014. Second factor impacting is uh, cost of utilities on city-owned 
facilities. As Council is aware, City owns a number of facilities and operates them, pools, community centers, and whatnot, and these have uh, utility costs. Utility costs have been increasing at a rate higher than inflation, so again, this is causing upward pressure on the tax rate increase. Third factor to consider is assessment growth. An assessment growth is additional tax rate revenue that uh, comes to the city based on new houses being built, uh, so it's additional revenue that it helps offset additional costs. And assessment growth trends over the last number of years have been declining. The city has been informed by MPAC that uh, an assess assessment expectation for this year is 1%, so that's what the city is using for uh, tax rate, or in setting the, the 2014 budget assuming 1% tax rate, or 1% assessment growth. And staff are working directly with, uh, with MPAC to ensure that that number is, is achieved, that all of the properties that are supposed to come online are captured and uh, will uh, be as part of the role uh, that's used for the end of the year. The next factor to consider is EDIF. There's already been a bit of discussion about that here this morning. Uh, EDIF, as Council knows, is a 10-year funding program that completed in 2013 and included a transfer directly from the tax base as well as issuing debt to fund that program. As of 2014, the direct transfer from the tax base is no longer le needed, so that's a benefit to the tax rate. It's a cost that was built into the 2013 budget but is no longer required in the 2014 budget. The cost to service the debt need to still be built into the budget and will continue to, to be there until that debt retires, but that doesn't happen until between 2020 and 2029. Another factor to consider or impacting the, this budget year is the Tax Stabilization Reserve Fund. For a number of years, this reserve fund has been used to subsidize the tax rate increases as funding has been transferred out of that reserve fund and into the tax base. The Tax Stabilization Reserve Fund is all but depleted now, so it cannot be used as a, an ongoing funding source as there's no funding in it. That needs to be eliminated, which causes upward pressure on the, on the tax rate increase. The final factors impacting the, the budget uh, I'll talk about together and we'll deal with it in a bit more detail on a future slide. And there are unfunded items and strategic initiatives. Both of these items have, uh, are, cannot be achieved within an inflationary budget target, so they, have not, they will not be included in the budget submission from staff as far as the, being part of the base budget, uh, but staff are suggesting that if assessment growth exceeds 1%, council could consider investing that in strategic initiatives or correcting uh, ongoing budget deficits, and we will talk about that in a, a little more detail in a future slide. So with all the budget context that we've talked about, the factors in fact, impacting the 2014 budget, the corporate leadership team, or CLT, is proposing uh, budget targets uh, for developing the 2014 budget. The CLT uh, proposed target is an overall tax rate increase of one, that should not exceed 1.25%. This is the most aggressive budget target uh, that's been brought forward to council during this term of council. It's lower than the CPI expectations for both the federal and provincial governments. And it responds directly to you know, what we've heard from citizens, that they're looking for a tax rate increase that approximates inflation, but has no impact on service levels. That being said, there will be efficiency requirements to meet that target of 1.25%. Staff will once again be required to find efficiencies within their operating budget to get to the 1.25% uh, budget target. Like last year, inflation will only be allowed for items of, concerning staff compensation, which are uh, governed by the collective agreements for those areas, and for utility costs. All other costs are going to be held flat. And it should be noted that those items that are being held flat have been held flat since 2011. So it's not as if they're just being held at 2013 levels, they're being held at 2011 levels. So over a uh, number of successive budgets, uh, staff have already had to find efficiencies time and time again in order to meet the, the budget targets. So they've had to find other ways to uh, deliver their, their services or reallocate budget dollars in order to pay for things that have seen inflation over that time, uh, but they have not been provided for inflation in their budget targets. 
I alluded to this before that uh, we'll come back to talk about uh, unfunded items and strategic initiatives and uh, this is where we'll discuss those. If assessment growth exceeds 1%, the 1% target, staff are saying that there are three different ways uh, that council could consider using that funded funding. So one of those areas would be to invest it in strategic initiatives. The strategic initiatives are for enhancements of existing services, providing new services, or implementing master plans and audit findings. Staff are proposing to bring back a short list of, of options to Council on the October 21st uh, committee day. Those will be tabled, uh, will be discussed through future budget processes and future uh, budget meetings, but it will allow a, a lot of time for Council to review them, have discussions with the, the public to provide, for the public to provide their input on it before Council has to make any kind of decision on final budget day in January. The, the list uh, proposed by staff will include items that are uh, priorities uh, of council that have been identified to staff as well as internal uh, priorities that, staff, that that council may not be aware of. A second option to for council to consider is investing in, in unfunded operating items. As council is aware, there are three uh, major areas that are underfunded, bylaw fine revenue, uh, utility costs at city facilities, and, and operations, and those areas are causing chronic deficits within the operating budget. Council could invest the additional assessment growth money into those areas and then would see uh, a decreased opportunity for negative variances and may actually see surpluses within the operating budget. And if the city were to see surpluses within the operating budget, that would be closed off to the tax stabilization reserve fund, which is pretty much depleted and therefore would be able to uh, build that up to its minimum balance. A final option for Council is just to let additional assessment revenue fall to the bottom line, which would have an impact of reducing the overall tax rate increase. So whatever that additional assessment growth is, it would drop the, uh, uh, the tax rate increase from 1.25% uh, down to, depending on how much uh, revenue is there. Turning our attention briefly to the enterprise budgets, CLT is proposing to follow the same principles that were used in the 2013 budget. That includes limiting uh, on controllable costs, things under the city's control, to limiting uh, the increase to those to an inflationary increase. But for non-controllable costs, so things like water and sanitary rates or increases that are passed through by the region, to allow those to flow through on the rates. So that may see um, water and sanitary increases that are above inflation, um, but it's a cause of the regional increase as opposed to what's under the city's control. Our second last uh, section to look at is the budget schedule, and we'll just uh, look briefly at that. The chart uh, on the screen is the same as the, in the, uh, the budget report, and it shows that the, the budget schedule is generally the same as the 2013 budget schedule. There are a number of dates that are bolded. Those indicate uh, public meetings, so there are a number of opportunities for citizens to come sit in the council chambers and hear the discussion on the 2014 budget uh, process in person. And finally, we'll look at the public input plan, which I was here for the last item. Uh, I know that there's a lot of interest in public engagement, and especially about the, 20, uh, about the budget. Um, the city of Kitchener has a, a good track record of opportunities for public engagement. On the slide, I've listed off a number of traditional methods, such as using print media and public delegation nights, as well as emerging in electronic media, so things like Twitter, Facebook, uh, budget websites. So the city's been employing that, a number of those for a number of years to solicit feedback and inform the public about the budget process. For 2014, uh, the city will continue using a number of those uh, budget input uh, opportunities or methods. And it's really in two, uh, two goals in mind. First is to inform the public on what's included in the 2014 budget. The second reason is to solicit feedback from the public. We just don't want to say, here it is, this is uh, what's going forward. We want to hear what they think about it. So there are a number of opportunities that are uh, shown on the screen where we'll, uh, citizens can come and, uh, and provide their input on the budget. Through these different methodologies, this will provide the, the public with several opportunities uh, to provide their input on the 2014 budget which has the goal in mind of meeting the expectation 
of uh, maintaining service levels at an inflationary tax rate increase. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll uh, close my presentation and take any questions. Very good, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, there are a number of people lined up here to speak. First, I have Councillor Singh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I had a suggestion also along with the recommendation, which I can come back after the questions are uh, all asked. And to you, Mr. Hagee, thank you a lot for taking all the fun out of this year's budget. You made it far too easy for us. So, so partly thank you, and then again, it's, it's not going to be as entertaining for this year, <laughs> perhaps. Um, some questions I had was for the impact assessment. Um, obviously, that's been alluded to already this year. Some of the, uh, um, I guess, the, the, it's, it's a little lower than where we were at last year. Is it perhaps that uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the development hasn't already been picked up by MPAC? That's partly. And uh, also uh, other developments are at later phases uh, in completion, which would come in line closer to the end of the year. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I would suggest that it is a, uh, a function of assessment that has already happened that may not have been picked up already by MPAC. Our staff have a good relationship with MPAC and are working directly with them. Uh, the number that we have seen as of the end of July is considerably lower than what we know is coming. And we, are, we believe that the 1% the target is uh, is achievable and hopefully that we'll be able to exceed that. Mm, that's great and that's good to see and I think it would be helpful for staff. Um, of, co of course we have to be fearful that uh, we, we end up, we don't end up being lower than that 1% either, that uh, we get on ongoing updates as to where we're sitting as uh, right. obviously more data comes in as well uh, right. as part of the, the full budget process. Um, the other question I had was um, for inflation. Um, so the projected uh, CPI inflation, uh, I'm going to deal with just for the province, um, is sitting at 1.5%. Uh, when they make that assessment, is that on, uh, ongoing? Do they readjust or this was the uh, projection that made last year, or the 2013 projected? Through you, Mr. Chair, the projection that the province is making was as of their budget process typically be uh, early in the year, but they did not pass their budget until later. So their projection is actually fairly current. I believe it's as of uh, April or May. Okay, that's, that's good, to, good, to, good to get that information. So it's in more line with additional data that's already come in for this year as Correct. well. Um, to compare, obviously the rolling average kind of gives a little bit uh, of cause for pause. It's sitting at 0.8% uh, relative to what the projection is at 1.5 for Ontario. Um, if you had to compare for last year, do we have any data on hand where the half point mark of last year, where um, inflation was sitting at relative to the end of year? We would have that, Mr. Chair. I don't have it with me, but we keep track of the, the monthly, uh, the Mr. monthly Chapman? changes. Through the chair, I don't have the specific numbers, but you may recall we actually started off trending high at the beginning of the year and inflation fell towards the bottom of the year. And so we're actually hopeful that we'll see a reversal of that trend and that because we ended so low last year, it's in the latter half of this year, that we'll actually see the month-to-month -month changes increasing. Uh, we don't know if June is the start of a trend, but certainly it's one of the highest numbers we've seen so far this year. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, and the last thing, we don't have data for July then. Um, okay. All right. No. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it generally comes out uh, the third Friday of the month, but not always. Yeah, I thought so. I wasn't sure. I know that sometimes these reports are done a little early, so I yeah. wasn't sure if uh, July data had come in yet or not. Um, so the last question I had for now was for the, uh, on page 5-9, for uh, tax stabilization. Uh, again, you refer to um, over-reliance on the tax stabilization fund to, uh, you know, uh, mitigate some of the tax increases in previous years where it's put uh, a lot of pressure and, again, it's, uh, the fund is almost depleted at this point. Correct. Now, reallocating uh, additional um, focus to it, uh, if you look at the summary, you're saying that uh, the emphasis would be uh, to put uh, some 955,000 or 0 .1, almost close to a percent. Correct. allocation towards the uh, tax stabilization. Is that just to meet the need for this year because of the uh, reliance on the previous years, or is this uh, ongoing funding to bring it to a certain level? I know you referred to it a little bit, but more explanation would be helpful. Through you, Mr. Chair, the 955 is the complete amount, or the total amount transferred from the tax stabilization reserve fund to the tax base as of 
2013. The reserve fund, uh, I believe right now, has about $700,000 in it. So this is a complete elimination of that, okay. that transfer. Uh, there is funding in it right now, but we're also projecting to have a deficit at the end of the year. So that would do. would deficit that would be if we if you don't do this uh, um, this you know, I guess, I guess uh, build it into the base uh, if if you were not to do it then there would be a deficit because there is seven hundred thousand uh, sitting in the in the reserve correct correct okay all right so we do have opportunity uh, if, to uh, of course there there's importance and uh, obviously to better fund you know plan for for our finances this. Uh, appropriate allocation to this this reserve is is necessary, and we do have to build it back to appropriate levels, which will take some time. But we don't have to be as aggressive to fund it uh, to this reserve at what's suggested in the summary. It's up for uh, for you, Mr. Chair. This isn't adding money to the reserve fund. This is taking the money, uh, eliminating the revenue coming in from that reserve fund. Yeah. Um, this is eliminating the money. Right now, there's a $955,000 that is transferred See, from the reserve I, I'm, fund. I'm looking at uh, projected le uh, percent levy increase. So the way I see it is, uh, when we look at the tax stabilization reserve fund of allocating, uh, it's building into the budget a 0.91%. Now that's going forward. For, it, it's going to be built into the budget. That means each year it would be able to fund 0.91% going forward, unless we were okay. to reallocate it in future years. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe what Councillor Singh is saying that there's, uh, his understanding is that it's almost that it's zero right now and we're at transferring 955 into the reserve fund. I, I realize there's some money there right now. But... The, the reality is that we're transferring money out of the reserve fund. So we're t right now there's a revenue of 955 coming in from the reserve fund. And I this see. is eliminating it because we can't, it, it's, um, a bank account essentially that has no more money, so we can't take okay. uh, money out of it. Okay, fair enough. Um, so again, I'll come back with my suggestion later. Actually, uh, in the interest of time, Councillor Singh, if you just wanted to, if, I'm not sure if it's in the form of a motion, but if you wanted to sort of float the idea of the suggestion just to save people from going around commenting on it a second time. Sure, I, that's no problem. I'll, I'll fine tune the wording to the, uh, the staff recommendation in the report. Uh, but it would be that uh, staff prepare uh, a budget uh, more closer in line to 1% uh, rather than the 1.25 that's in the staff recommendation. I don't think it's too far off. Uh, it's primarily to safeguard in case uh, inflation doesn't end up being uh, at the uh, you know, uh, projected amount. Uh, and also, um, if, if it does, uh, it will give council opportunity to perhaps uh, fund uh, areas that are unfunded, uh, some, you know, certain areas that uh, Mr. Hagee has already alluded to, and one thing that hasn't been already mentioned, but the EAB is a looming problem that has to be considered. So it gives multiple opportunities. So, okay, thank you. Um, and again, uh, same for the rest of the committee. If um, you have intention, please sort of make that intention known so we can sort of get it all on the table. Uh, Councillor Yuneski. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, appreciate uh, being able to comment on this and uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the tightness of the report. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that the starting point, uh, 1.25, is much lower than we had last year and, uh, and all the challenges we have. But I'm not sure whether the 1.25 will be even more challenging because there will be not too much wiggle room uh, on this, but on the other hand, it may be easier. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see that uh, process when we when we get there. Um, I'm glad we are at the 1.25 starting point. I'm not prepared to uh, go down to 1.0 as suggested in the amendment. Um, I think we do need some uh, looking where we're going. Uh, by the time we get to the end of the year, we'll see where the inflation rate is as well. It may be coming up on an upswing, as as, as noted. Uh, that's something we'll just uh, have to take a look at in the next. Uh, four, five, six months as we get to, uh, to the January date. Uh, a couple of questions I have. I noticed in the report um, that you alluded that we got one of the lowest uh, uh, tax rates in, in, in the province, and you got that chart listing about two dozen municipalities, and we are near the bottom. But actually, that's without the, uh, uh, the swim component, which is what's included in other municipalities, because you did allude that if we include that, then we swing over to the right a little more. That's correct? Correct. Okay. 
Um, one thing I find with your assessment comment is that uh, your, your target is 1% and uh, if we do achieve that then we can now fund money to different potential projects or uh, areas that we feel are, are worthy of it. Yet you note that our growth uh, as of July is 0.03%. Correct. Which is really nothing really compared to previous years, which is one and a half, one point eight, two percent as we go backwards. So it's really been going down. In fact, it looks like it's really down to nothing. And you did indicate that you're going to try to target to work with impact to, to try to get them to, uh, uh, to, to, to get the assessment uh, reevaluated and updated, basically, which, which, is, which is a good target. However, I've also noted that based on comments from staff and other departments that our building permits have also been down over the last 12 months or so, just for whatever reasons, the economy just sort of slowing down, uh, although interest rates are still reasonable, inflation is very, very reasonable, and I find it sort of hard to um, understand why the assessment is not moving quicker if those factors are look so favorable. In fact, I also wonder when you have a comment of um, we have one of the lowest uh, rankings of taxes in the province, meaning that we're one of the most affordable cities in Ontario, Correct. which I would agree with. Then why isn't our assessment growing? Okay. Why uh, are people coming? Uh, Mr. Chapman, do you want to comment first? Three, Mr. Chair, we have exactly the same questions as you do. We've seen building permit activity. We have closed building permits that should be <coughs> contributing to new assessment. Uh, in fact, internally, we're able to build up right now to a number at year end that would be as high as 0.9%. So we don't know why impact has not picked that up. We're pursuing it with them, and we're committed, as Ryan noted, uh, to push really hard to get to that 1% number and go beyond it to the extent we can. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I know it's a challenge. It's just but, for, it'll... but it's a mystery to us as well as to why that's not been picked up year to date, but we're on it, and we'll pursue it to the end okay. of the year. Okay, appreciate that. Um, there's no reference here at all in terms of uh, the potential uh, increase uh, of user fees. Uh, where's, where are you coming from on that? What's, what's your focus on in terms of percentage increase? It's always been more than we've always budgeted for in terms of the tax rate because user fees are user you know, oriented. Uh, where are you going on this? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we, the internal guideline for user fees is 2% increase. Okay. And so just quick, that one, it was 3% last year, correct? Correct. It was 3% last year, yeah. Oh, and uh, final comment, you uh, talked about two different options and uh, the impacts of the chronic deficit being the uh, bylaw fine revenues, uh, water utility cost operation, but you also mentioned electricity costs. How does that fit into our uh, scenario here, hydro stuff? So through, through you, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the electricity costs are the electricity costs we have to pay for city-run facilities. So the city has... City Hall, we've got the lights on our... So light. hydro increases the cost, and we've got to pay for that? Correct. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Inetis. Thanks, Ryan, for your presentation. And I uh, really like the way where we're heading in, with the, in the direction with our budget. And uh, I just wanted to get a few questions about, one in particular, about our local... Uh, our, our local uh, tax comparison, and you have Waterloo as before swim phase, and do you have roughly an idea what there would be with that swim fee? Through you, Mr. Chair, I don't recall what the exact amount is. It, the, the tax rate increase is lower because they're moving. Essentially, we did it all in one shot. Okay. They're doing it over a number of years. Yep. Uh, but for comparative purposes, uh, the 1.55 1, 1 is effectively what their tax rate increase was in 2013, and they're suggesting 246. So we're, we're in a lot better shape than they are currently? Correct. Okay. Um, one other thing that you touched upon, but you didn't really, me you mentioned it in the report, and for the benefit of the l new live streaming, I was wondering if you could just give a little bit of more of what MPI is and the differences in between what's in MPI. Sure. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, MPI stands for Municipal Price Index. 
And the city calculates that every year, they say what are the inflation, in factors, inf inflation factors on the municipality as opposed to an individual. So CPI is calculated for the average consumer, average household, the types of things that they buy. It includes cost of housing, groceries, those types of things. A municipality is different as a municipality has to buy asphalt and contracted services and uh, pay uh, employees. So the city calculates a municipal price index that says what are the inflation factors unique to the municipality and it's different than the inflation factors for a, an individual. Okay, that's great. And uh, I guess my, my, I'll make it just a final comment. I'm, I'm willing to support Councillor uh, Singh's uh, re uh, update or recommendation. That I think uh, we can always try to squeeze a little bit more if we can. If not, um, then we know where we stand and uh, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a few questions and um, s some of them have come out of your presentation. Uh, thank you very much for uh, very clear and concise. It is in, uh, it's good to know that we're at least working towards an inflationary increase. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the um, questions I have is if, if we are if we, um, oh, just a quick question to the chair. Has this been moved yet? It has not. It has not been moved, okay. Um, and so if I wanted to move it, then? Councillor Singh, Councillor Singh requested he made an to amendment. bring forward. Yes, yeah, so he'll be, okay. I'm not sure he's making an amendment or making a motion, but so I'll have to go to Councillor Singh first. Okay, yeah. okay. I just, wa I wanted to know what, whether I was jumping the queue on, on some things. Okay. Um, if we were to go with the 1% um, uh, amended, motion by Councillor Singh. Would we be able to get a, a rough idea of what the 20, what the 0.25% would be in a dollar value? Through the chair, 2.5% uh, is about 250,000. It would be a little bit higher, maybe 265. Okay. So that, I get the reason I'm asking that is I would like to have an understanding um, because in a meeting I had with Mr. Chapman, uh, our discussion was around anything above inflation could be used, uh, as you pointed out in your graph, uh, for um, strategic initiatives or um, to reduce the budget or for operating budget deficits. Is that right? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, is there a way that we can reduce some of our non-fixed costs, our, like our electricity and our water, um, within our facilities even more. Uh, I know that I have brought this up in the past about um, lights being on, and I know that we have a system that we're using so that, that um, lights are, are dimmed and, turn, and, and clo closed, turned off, sorry, um, at a certain time. Can we reduce that by a couple of hours? So instead of all of the lights you know, shutting off at 10 or 11, I think it is, that it goes to 8 o'clock. Could we see a savings if we were to do that through an entire year? Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's, Ms. Houston, uh, but just, I want to be careful, too, that we don't get into, again, specific examples of how we can reduce the budget. That should be handled at, offline or at a separate time, but Ms. Houston. Thank you, Chair Davey. Um, we can look at that. Again, we do have an, an active energy management program, and we do have automated control systems for most of our facilities that, that do some of that work automatically. Um, I believe FM will be bringing a energy management report to Council in, in the near future, possibly the fall, um, to give you some of that information. But we do take a pretty aggressive approach to that already, but we will look at, at it again for budget purposes. Okay, that, that would be great. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, my understanding is um, that if we don't achieve the 1% uh, growth, then we would need to increase the tax levy by that difference. So if we only achieved a 0.9% uh, assessment growth, we would have to offset that by increasing our tax. If we were to go with the 1%, we'd have to go up to 1.1. Is that right? Through the chair, it, it would either be that option or before the budget is tabled, staff would have to try to find about $100,000 to offset that difference. Okay, okay. Is that um, direction that you'd want from us at this point in time? 
If I can respond to that question, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, I think our commitment, if Council supports the recommendation, is to submit a budget at 1.25% or lower. We're confident enough today that our assessment growth is approaching 1% to make that commitment. And so as Ryan said, if we fall short by a small margin, we would work to find that within the target that Council sets. I wouldn't be making that commitment if we felt that assessment growth was only going to be 0.2 or 0.3% for 2014. Okay, thanks, I appreciate that. Um, I know that um, we've talked in the past about uh, salary increases and um, ones that are outside of our, our uh, collective agreement control. Um, will there be salary increases in, built into this budget at the 1% or 1.25%? Through the chair, yes, there are salary increases built in. The, one, the contracts that are known are at the known amounts. Ones that are unknown, there's an estimate put in. Okay, but, we, but I'm, I'm talking about the ones that are not in, uh, in a collective agreement. So are the, there is, is there's salary increases built into, the, into that budget as well? Correct. Okay, so is there um, some direction that we can give now already so that we're not surprising people? You, I mean, you're, it's your prerogative if you want to. I, I w again, I would suggest that if you're interested in that discussion, we should handle it as we have in previous budgets closer to the time to deal with it at, at operating. Well, I, you and know, I, Chair, I don't want to delay that. I'll maybe, let Mr. Chapman talk. Mr. Chapman? And maybe I can offer one fact. I think typically uh, where councils exercise that discretion has been around senior management um, salary adjustments. The city's policy says that management staff follow the collective agreement for 791. And this is the year that Council will give direction for the renegotiation of the 791 contract. And so my suggestion is that uh, ultimately that's the vehicle to give direction. Uh, we've always identified the concerns around compression or pay equity when you vary um, steps at different rates. And so we will be coming forward to seek direction for the 791 contract. Presently the Council policy says whatever is awarded through that contract, which you will agree to, uh, would apply to the balance of the salary grid. Okay, and that will come to us before the budget? Uh, we can certainly make a commitment to have that discussion with you before the budget. We may not be seeking a formal mandate, but certainly your direction for budget estimates, yes, we can. Yeah, I think that would be, I think that would be prudent. Um, the other um, question I have is regarding overtime policy. What, um, maybe we can have a discussion, at, I don't want to enter into a huge discussion right now, but what is our policy? Uh, can we affect that, that, that set direction about overtime now? for next year's budget. No, you don't understand. <laughs> Am I not I, being clear? I'm sorry. Through, through the chair, I understand the question. I just don't know that I'm in a place to, to comment on it or whether, it provi it, whether it's uh, appropriate within the, the entire budget context. I, I just, th that if there's an opportunity now to start saying that we don't want to have um, any overtime in, in the coming year so that we can keep our, within line with the 1%, then if we start setting that direction now, then we may put ourselves in a better position. And what I might suggest, Mr. Chairman, is that I think Council would probably benefit from some information on overtime practices and costs and that sort of thing. And so either as an issue paper or if more appropriately under Labor Relations as a caucus discussion, we can bring that back through the process. Okay, I think that would be, that would be prudent to have it again uh, beforehand so that we can sort of get our uh, heads around those numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I, I would like to uh, suggest that I am, w would like to support Councillor Singh's 1%. I think that we can get there, and uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a good incentive. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, I want to start off by saying that this is the 40th time I have worked on I've been dealing with City of Kitchener's budget, so I think that's interesting to me, if to no one else. <laughs> uh, just a couple of questions. I'd like to know if you could go to five nine or that sheds are there. What what is it that uh, is a cause? What what changes are there? For example, is the base inflation is that? Uh, what have what have you used? Through the chair, the, the amount of $2.6 million or 2.5 percent, uh, or sorry, I'll just back up. All the information in that chart was uh, 
comes out of the 10-year tax rate no, forecast I realize from that. last year. So what, what has changed to, so that we come in with 1.25? Through the chair, I'll draw your attention down to uh, line D, it's subtotal one, the black line. Mm. You'll see all of the items above that subtotal to 1.92%. A reduction of 0.67% is required to get down to 1.25%, and that's what staff have committed to uh, doing as part of developing the budget process or tabling a budget before council. Uh, staff will review all of the budget items and reduce where required to get to 1.25 percent. The items below that, you'll see strategic initiatives and unfunded items have been completely removed from, uh, from the forecasted budget, and those would only be considered by council if assessment growth exceeds 1 percent. Okay, so that, that's the point. I wanted to, yeah, where you, you had those all in last year, in the 10 year, you've taken them out, and you reduced the top, you said by point, what, six? 0.67. Seven, yeah. So, w which came out of what? Through the chair, it's those are just the reductions that are required to get to the, the targeted amount of 1.25 percent. It okay. hasn't come out of any one specific oh, okay. line. All right. So, going back, uh, when people are preparing budgets, what are you using for the base inflation? And I think just to clarify the point, that 0.67 really is coming against base inflation. Uh, and so what we're doing is only allowing increases for collectively bargained wage settlements and for things like utility costs. All our lines are being held flat. It doesn't mean there are no increases in many of those lines. It just means we'll have to offset those increases with reductions elsewhere. Okay. That, so that, that's the point. That, that figure, that's where most of this comes from, out of that line there. That's correct. Yeah. Um, I have one big concern about next year, and that's with with our uh, firefighters arbitration. What, what plans do we have if we, we know that that's not gonna go in the direction we want it to go? So and I would suggest, Mr. Chair, we're certainly happy to have that discussion. I would suggest that as we recess into caucus, we can discuss it there. Uh, labor relations staff will be in attendance, in fact, and so we can speak to it in caucus shortly. Okay, I think that's important because we need to deal with that. Uh, as far as uh, uh, this, it's now being called Mr. Singh's recommendation, I will support it if you'll put just one word in before that figure of one, if you'll put a, the word below in. Okay. I, I, I reason, uh, I'd really like to give, I know staff have a big challenge ahead of them to get where we are, and, but i just like to give staff a little more, a little, little bigger challenge. I know that they can do it. So, thank you. Councilor Rabinovich. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, and I too want to uh, thank staff for the, um, the recommendation that's before us. Um, I think it is uh, fairly aggressive and uh, it, it's hard not to note uh, the chart on page 5-2 that's actually seen us move back one spot from being the sixth lowest to now being the fifth lowest. So I think that uh, demonstrates the, uh, the positive work that's been done by uh, both this council and our staff in terms of uh, uh, dealing with things. Um, I do want to uh, clarify um, the motion that Councillor Singh is bringing forward with the uh, suggested change, because I would like to, uh, to be supportive of it. Um, if I understand it correctly, you're suggesting that staff would come in at, at 1%, uh, assuming that the annual inflation uh, comes in at 1% at or less. If in fact the number is is higher, in other words, if it's at 1.25 or higher, the target remains 1.25, is that correct? Councillor Singh? I can only speak for myself and my effort is to come in with a budget that's at inflation and if inflation ends up being higher than 1%, I think we have to look at opportunities to look at within the corporation of areas that are un underfunded. So, yes, to answer your question. Okay, because th th that, was, that was important to me because I, I, I think 
you know, if I'm willing to, I think it's important that we accept that, that target of inflation, but if, if in fact inflation was going to be um, higher, depending on what happens in the last few months of the year, I was, I was concerned that we were setting a, an increasingly unrealistic um, amount for, uh, for staff and ultimately us to, uh, to attain. So I will be supporting uh, your, uh, your, your recommendation. I think uh, it allows staff to come forward with some, some additional uh, recommendations around either additional revenues or, uh, or, or cuts that uh, would get us to that 1% uh, and allow us to uh, be in that uh, inflation target zone. Um, and uh, as, as you indicated, if we see some uh, uh, gains through things like assessment and so on, we can, uh, we can begin to address uh, some of the unfunded uh, items in the, in the budget as well. Mayor Zer. Thank you. Um, I had a private conversation with Councillor Singh here just to, to understand um, the, the motion. I think we have to have the written, or not written, but this very specific motion here because I am uh, quite confused by the discussions that are going on. The target is either 1% or it's 1.25 or it's inflation. Uh, and before I make my comments, I need to know that because I have uh, some uh, concerns about where, where this is going. I had some questions as well. Councillor Singh, are you prepared to actually put the motion or I guess the manager? Okay. If you could just sir, if you could ring in there you go. Thank you. Councillor Singh, we'll go back to you, Mayor Zara. So if I can briefly just say something beforehand, so um, just to give clarity as well. Uh, you know, I, I want to be very um, you know, I want to commend staff for bringing a, a budget that's very fair. Uh, and very reasonable at this point. It's cognitive of what Council has said in, in previous budget processes that our efforts to bring a budget that's more in line to inflationary increase, and that's what our taxpayers want to. And that's why my original intent was for it not to be a totally separate motion, but it, to be more of a complementary uh, amendment to what's, uh, what staff is recommending. That So uh, as part of the motion that they're saying, they're, therefore be resolved, the staff be directed to submit uh, the 2014 tax-supported budget with a levy increase now exceeding 1.2 percent that can stand. My amendment to that is that staff also be directed to bring forward suggestions for an additional quarter percent decrease and this be explored and I want to put emphasis on, on this as well and this be explored if it hasn't already by staff. This be explored with setting aggressive revenue generation targets from our sponsorship strategy and that uh, an additional uh, from adjustments that have limited service level impact. Um, hopefully that clarifies to some of your, your concern, Mr. Mayor, or? Okay, then if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, if uh, we follow then what Councillor Singh is suggesting, we really do need to have this motion on the floor first and he needs to make an amendment to add those comments and the, the supplementary. Until that point, I was unclear whether he was moving this motion or yeah, introducing new I wasn't either, so. Um, uh, Point of order, Councillor Ivanovich. Sorry, in, in all due respect, I mean, if Councillor Singh is moving the motion, um, I, I would believe, Mr. Chair, that he's able to either move the recommendation before us or move a, a different recommendation. I don't disagree with that. And, That's not and what I'm saying. if it's a different one, then we can ask that a certain clause be dealt with separately. Okay. So I'm he, not disagreeing with that. I heard Councillor Singh just say a moment ago that he agrees with the recommendation that is here but wants to add something. So I don't care who moves it, whether it's Councillor Singh and adds something to it or uh, Councillor Fernandez said has the motion been moved yet. Um, uh, I'm not looking to, to, that I have to move it. I just want to have the process so I know what I'm voting on and when. So Mr. Chair, with your direction. Okay, so as I understand, Councillor Singh, you can just, I guess, nod. You're moving the motion as it is with the amendment that... For the additional suggestions for okay. uh, reductions by a quarter. Okay. Um, and could you just, for, for one final time, could you repeat the actual amendment to the existing... It's an addition to the in motion, addition to that's correct, correct, yeah. Okay. Okay, all right. It's an addition to the motion. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and could you, sorry, could, could you repeat it one last time so we have it? So the addition to the motion is that staff be directed to bring forward suggestions for an additional quarter percent reduction to the um, tax supported budget levy increase 
uh, where it's already uh, recommended by staff that not be uh, exceeding 1.25%. Um, and this be, uh, be explored through setting aggressive revenue generation targets from the sponsorship strategy. And the suggestions uh, for reductions that would come forward, uh, that, they be, uh, that they have limited service level impact. Okay. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you for the clarification, cause, because I, uh, I wanted to make sure that the, uh, the rest of what was being talked about in the recommendation that's uh, before us on 5-1 were included, and they are now, and that's good. And I can support the, uh, the revised motion which Councillor Singh is bringing forward now. Uh, the only uncomfortableness that I have with that is uh, not to, to have a lower rate, but in terms of um, the kind of direction, you know, the kind of um, consequence of establishing something lower than where they are at this point in time, is that it will take an inordinate amount of time to work on a relatively small dollar figure, $250,000, in that they are already having to find efficiencies from the 1.9, I think it is, down to the 1.25. I have an, an uncomfortable feeling about it, but for this purpose, at this time, I can support the, uh, the recommendation. But I think if it becomes a, uh, a major task, and the, normally when uh, some of those uh, those cuts come back to us for further uh, reductions, they're, uh, they're unpalatable quite often by members of council or majority of council. And so I'm just concerned the, uh, the length of uh, time and the energy that will go into what may not be acceptable. But at this point in time, I can support the recommendation with the addition that Councilor Singh has put on. Okay, um, I've, I, yeah, I have some questions as well, and it's, yeah. Uh, first off, I, I want to be clear on this um, question of staff. Right now, I mean, part of the problem here is you do have the percentage target of 1.25%, but between the moving target, and I'm looking for a professional opinion, between the moving target of assessment growth and the moving target of inflation, is staff confident that we will reach, we will bring in a budget that will be at inflation by the end of the year. Mr. Chapman. We cannot predict what inflation will be. Uh, we think we're certainly within the reasonable range. Um, to the points around resourcing and workload, it's certainly an advantage for us if Council can agree to some principles now and then we're held to those through the balance of the budget process. What will be a challenge is if based on um, some new information in December or January, there's a fundamental change to the budget direction. That's when it's difficult for us to adjust. Uh, but at this point in time, we have a reasonable degree of confidence around the assessment growth number. It would appear as if inflation is trending within this range, and if Council can see its way to get clear direction today, uh, we have the next couple of months to work towards that direction. Okay, so in terms of Councilor Singh's motion, then, I guess my question would be, what would staff be doing then to, because we haven't actually said, well, Councilor Singh mentioned the sponsorship strategy, which, which is a separate question. Um, I, is there any revenue <coughs> generation expected in 2014 via the sponsorship, sponsorship strategy? Mr. May? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's work that's currently underway, uh, so I don't have that answer for you. The intention we were aiming for in October or November time frame uh, to bring the strategy back. All I would say to Council is what I've said about the sponsorship strategy every time I've spoken. It will take many years uh, to hit the types of targets that I know some councillors have spoken about, and I am not confident at this point, uh, I can't say to you today that there'll be revenue next year. Okay. But on that point, Mr. Chair, if council is open to alternative revenue suggestions, it's still helpful to have that in the clause, that council would entertain um, alternate revenue sources as opposed to simply service level or budget reductions. So even if not through sponsorship, if Councillor Singh's intent here is that we're looking at, at non-tax revenue, revenue sources, sources right. I would suggest that you keep that reference in. Okay. And I guess one last question. So I'm unclear, and a question of Councillor Singh, I'm unclear. So supposing that we come back in October, for example, and inflation is ticking up, like it's ticked up as we're, some of us are expecting it will, would staff still be presenting an additional 0.25% reduction? Yes, yes. Okay. 
there's a, there's a lot of areas within the corporation that are underfunded that we have to look at. So it gives us advantage to do so. Okay, I'm going to go to Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate the clarification about other revenue streams. Can you give me a sense of what, what that is? From time to time, we identify that we do not charge for a fee that's very commonplace uh, elsewhere in municipal government, and we brought those recommendations forward to Council. Uh, as some councillors will attest to, not always without controversy, um, but certainly we want to explore those, and some of those may find their way onto the list. And would that also be um, like we did last year, where you believe we used some of the revenue from the solar panels? Is that the same kind of idea? No, I don't, I don't believe so, although certainly we'll look at creative solutions. The other operative word I heard in that resolution was minimal service level impact, and so we can't commit that there will be no service level reductions, but for the value that we're talking about, we will not bring forward items that we know are non-starters um, and would have major service level impact. Okay. 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 I have no further questions. It's been moved by Councillor Singh. I would think that a recorded vote is in order, even though I haven't. Councillor Singh, do you want to comment? Um, quickly, I think uh, through the discussion back and forth, uh, um, there's a strong handle as to what the intent of change to the staff recommendation was, but if I can still speak to the change, I would make Please. a comment if that would be appropriate, because I don't think I've really had the, the full potential, uh, full ability to, to do so uh, with the earlier questions. So um, without repeating the, uh, the change, uh, what, what I pretty much want to say is that, uh, um, you know, the uh, revenue generation was, or the sponsorship strategy was an example towards areas that we need to be looking at, that this corporation needs to, uh, constantly look at uh, areas uh, that we can utilize uh, from uh, returns on our assets, uh, assets that are owned by our taxpayers and they expect better returns on them. And so if you can think outside the box to look at revenue generation uh, potentials, we need to seek those, uh, those out. And if they can mitigate to lower the tax impact, we, we, have, to, we have to take that ability. Um, and of course the uh, um, additional ways that can be done is from previous uh, budgets where suggestions have come forward uh, with uh, changes within the corporation or efficiencies, but of, co of course the, the key point was that it, be, it have the, um, a low impact on our service levels. And um, uh, I think it's already, the, the essence of the change has already been made that it's not to, to suggest that the budget come in line at 1%. It's whatever the budget comes in, um, you know, um, due to whatever the, the economies uh, are at that point, that there still be additional quarter percent suggestions uh, so that if we have the ability uh, to, to, um, to build into our base budget to mitigate on some uh, areas of a corporation uh, where the, the funding isn't there, especially uh, the EAB. Uh, that's one area that has no funding allocation yet and needs some uh, significant uh, resource allocation that we have to take that opportunity at that point. It gives us additional quarter percent buffer no matter what. Okay. I'll just comment briefly as well. I'll, I'll support uh, the amendment. I just wanted to comment briefly on the work here as well. Uh, I'm, I think what we're looking at right here is fantastic. I think that you know we went out and asked a difficult question in the survey last year about what's an appropriate amount of money. It's, it's always difficult to ask somebody, what can you afford? To, what can you afford? Um, but we went out and asked the question, they gave, we were mandated inflation. And I wanna commend staff for responding because you know, last year our increase was one of the lowest in Ontario, 1.39, and now the, the upper end target, 1.25, is, is really fantastic. So um, very happy to see what's before us and I'll be supporting Councillor Singh's motion. Uh, sorry, I have Councillor Gazzola in the queue, did you? Okay, just very briefly. Hey, uh, I had asked that uh, and, uh, that the uh, that the word below would be put in. I've always supported going with the inflation rate, and right now the inflation rate is 0 0.8, and I, I would I would like to see that. I, I I just think we're not talking a lot of dollars. It's just the principle of of what we're holding before before us, that we're, we're sticking to it, that, that we, we, we've always, we've tried over the years to, to stick to it. I've always felt that we can stick to it. I know that we're, we have a low tax rate and all that, and we well should have. We're the only city in the province that has a gas 
natural gas operation that's putting a lot of dollars into our into our system. So uh, I, I'm not going to support what's before, but not that I don't. I just want to live on my principle that uh, I wanted. I would like to see us go by the inflation rate. Thank you, Councillor Galloway Sealock. Final word. Sorry, I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, I just figure I'll make a couple comments. I think that for early in the um, stage of our budget process, we're sitting in a really good point. And I think the additional direction that's given um, is something that's important. Um, we still have the ability to get to inflation no matter where it ends up now. We're in August, and it's really um, a guessing game right now. And I think as we continue to get closer to final budget, we'll be able to um, see what its assessment growth is as well as what is, uh, inflation is. So if inflation stays at 0.8% as it is now, we still have the ability as a council to get to that level. Um, in, in various ways, but I think this is a really good direction for August the 12th um, in our budget process. So uh, it's the first time with uh, me being around this table that we're even starting at this point, so I commend staff on that. Okay. Recorded vote's been called. And that carries. <clears throat> okay, we will move on to the final item, which is essentially a housekeeping item. I'm not sure if anyone's speaking to it. Um, can I get a mover, actually? Moved by Councillor Galloway Sealock. Uh, Councillor Gazzola, question. Yeah, I'm just curious as to why, why this is being taken immediately to Council today. I, I don't understand, what, what are we doing here? And I'm saying this, Mr. Turner, you're, you're aware of why I'm, uh, I, I, I happen to have a, an issue in the ward that I represent that is dealing with this very thing. And I, I, I'm just, I'm not sure what we're doing here, what is it saying, and uh, it's obviously been around for a long time. Why do we have to take it to council immediately and pass it today? Mr. Turner? Through you, Mr. Chairman, first of all, th this is a housekeeping amendment that really doesn't change the intent of the bylaw. What it, um, what it speaks to is situations where people choose to store their, um, their household garbage outside. We've always had a provision in our lot maintenance bylaw that allows them to do it, but there was an interaction between our lot maintenance bylaw <coughs> sorry, excuse me, and uh, the city's waste collection bylaw, which was basically declared redundant many years ago when the region took over waste collection. So it's really something that we just noticed recently dealing with, uh, as a result of dealing with a couple of um, situations that are currently on our books. So um, it's my understanding that uh, this was referred to special counsel uh, to give us the opportunity to, um, to move forward with it um, with a couple of particular situations that we have now, given that uh, the council meeting is delayed by one week um, so it'll be two weeks from now that uh, we'd be able to act next. Yeah, so why can't it be ratified in two weeks? Why, why? I mean, how long has this been out of, out of whack? Well, it's been out of whack for, for several years, but we just noticed it recently when dealing with a couple of uh, um, situations that um, we weren't able to effectively deal with. And when we looked at the bylaw, we realized that it was uh, something that should have been cleaned up years ago and never was. Well, in view of what's going on in, in the ward that I represent, and you're well aware of it, I, I would like to leave this to have it go through its normal process. Okay, that, that's a statement. Uh, it's a request, I guess, because I want to take it off of today's council. Okay, to, we, I'll take that then. Um, Councillor galloway Sealock. I would request actually the opposite because I'm dealing with something uh, very specific with regards to this in the ward that I represent. Um, it's a matter that's been going on for a long time and residents are choosing um, not to 
necessarily be good neighbors and this gives us the ability um, as, as bylaw to try and um, enforce and, and help a very negative situation um, that is is brewing with neighbors so um, I've uh, I've also been in dealing with this matter and actually when uh, seeing uh, well, first of all because we are in the summer months and uh, the problem of uh, what I'm dealing with is, is worse in the summer months. I think it's important for us to move forward and be able to um, have a little bit stronger leg to stand on when it comes to this matter and uh, with regards to neighbors. So I would ask that it continue to move forward so we can deal with it in uh, a sooner manner than, uh, a later, than a later date. And actually on that point on recollection, I don't have, I don't believe we have power at this point to, you have to, you have to raise that at special counsel if I'm correct. You couldn't, we couldn't take it off. You just vote on it, this issue now, and then <coughs> if you didn't want to deal with it at special counsel, then you'd have to bring I'll up the point. again there. Thank you. Okay, I have no other comments. Moved by Councillor Galloway Sealock. Those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, um, Mr. <coughs> Goody, just in terms of, you might want to think about timing to start uh, community services, if you could. Um, Councillor, or Mayor Zaire is going to be taking for special counsel. Yes, uh, we'll have the special council meeting uh, right now, and it, yes, we should talk about timing. So let's deal with the uh, items. The agenda is in front of you. Uh, there are th three items that have come forward from the uh, financing the corporate services. Someone prepared to move those first three items. By Councillor Singh, second Councillor Galloway Sealock. Discussion on those three items. Seeing none, we're not. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot. Uh, I don't have Councillor, so I would Cal know. Councillor Gazzola, yes. I okay, Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, no, I would like to remove that item and, and let it go its normal course. Two weeks is not going to be. All right. I, I, I'm, I've been opposed all along to issues being dealt with and not given their fair one week, and in this case, two weeks uh, time for. Okay, in order to deal with that, would you move, are you moving a deferral? I'll move a deferral to, to the 26th of August, the for, 26th that, of August. for the third yeah. item. Yes. Okay, we'll deal with that item first. Okay, and actually I have Councillor Fernandez, is, that on, is it on the same item? Councillor Fernandez. I just, I just wanted to, uh, uh, to understand a little bit more um, because I, I, I do feel when, I'm read, when I was reading this and thinking what is this all about? So in order to have a bit more understanding about that, I would like a little bit of time. So I have no idea what, really what this is about and I think that seeing the two different perspectives, I think it's important for not only me, but others to understand what it's all about. All right. Moving, uh, there's a motion for deferral. Are you seconding that motion? Okay. Motion uh, then we're dealing with is simply the deferral. Recorded so, vote, please. Recorded vote's been called for. I guess I have to come over there, Councillor. Oh, okay. Well, we can, can we stand up and do a recorded vote rather than you having to move? Can we just stand Second. up? Okay, all right. It hasn't been switched, so we can okay. stay here. Recorded vote's been called for. We'll deal with it that way, electronically, as we always have. This is uh, strictly for the deferral. Okay. Has everyone voted? The, it is a tie vote, uh, a tie vote is lost. lost. That's our rules of procedure. So it will therefore be dealt with today. Okay, uh, then we will deal with them separately, or the, we'll take the first two items first, in case someone wants to vote differently. Those in favor of, the, of items one and two, that's carried. Item number three, those recorded vote, please. Recorded vote's been asked for. It's an item number three. I'll just say that if you deal with this, uh, if it is defeated uh, at this point in time, uh, in order for it to come back, it would require um, a motion for reconsideration. That 
motion is therefore carried. Item number four, Councillor Verbanovich. I don't think you have to read it uh, in whole, but go ahead. Oh, sorry. I keep thinking Mayor Zerzan. <laughs> no worries. Um, I won't bother reading it because I think Council has read the motion. I will just add that we add in the second, uh, sorry, in the first paragraph, the words the Canadian Pacific Railway, because I learned uh, after the printing of this that actually the one spur that goes out towards um, the former Kitchener frame lands uh, out behind Fairway and so on is actually CP uh, Railway uh, Spur as opposed to CN or GXR. Um, and really the motion uh, speaks to, to two issues. One, supporting the work that FCM is doing on, on railway safety. It's a file that they've been engaged in for many years but has uh, reached much more prominence uh, in the last uh, number of weeks uh, after the uh, tragedy in Lac uh, Megantique as well as the situation in, uh, in Calgary uh, post their floods. And secondly, uh, looking to uh, have the railways uh, act proactively in the meantime and provide uh, necessary information uh, to our fire department uh, so that they have the info they need from a emergency preparedness point of view. Uh, and that would be something that obviously they would, uh, I'm, I'm not specifying what that necessary information is, that's something that they would work through with uh, uh, our, our fire chief. I would presume it primarily focuses around uh, volume of, 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 of particular content and, and traffic uh, in, our, in our community. It's my understanding that on average uh, we have about one train uh, a day coming in on, uh, freight train coming in on, on each of those uh, two main lines, uh, one in the south, one in the north, uh, through, uh, through the community. And so uh, I'll, I'll move that. Is there a second here? Councillor Ioannidis. Any discussion? Lots. Councillor Fernandez. Just a, a quick uh, um, question on this. Are we talking, uh, I, I guess I'm wondering if this is going to add more work um, to uh, Chief Beckett's um, job description, um, does it require more time, what are the ramifications for our staff? As well as we're focusing on rail, but we do have multitudes of trucks that come in and out of the, uh, out of the city that are carrying all kinds of toxic chemicals and, and flammable materials. Where does that place us with regard to, to that uh, and how do we oversee those? Chief Beckett. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of the workload, uh, it, will, it will add some workload, but I'm not, uh, at this point in time, I'm not sure to what extent because we haven't had that discussion with the railways to, to find out exactly what it means, what it will entail, and what it looks like. So um, it's going to take some time to, to um, I guess, investigate and look into that. As for uh, our Roadways, um, Transportation Dangerous Goods Act requires uh, all vehicles to be placarded and, uh, and they will carry manifests uh, in, in, the, in the units, including the railways, um, that when we do have incidents uh, on site that uh, we're able to at least gather placard information which will give us uh, an indication of what they're carrying and then we can uh, set up our operations based on that information. Um, in order to keep track of all the, the dangerous goods that travel through through our uh, our city uh, on vehicles, um, it would be absolutely impossible to do. And um, I think working with railways, we we know when the trains are going to be coming through. We can at least know their manifest of what they're carrying. Um, if nothing else, that if we do have an a, an incident, uh, we may not be able to prevent the incident, but we'll be able to know what we're dealing with. Okay. Thank you. Councillor uh, Ineski. Yeah, question to uh, Chief Beckett again, just uh, further on this. Uh, my concern was also with regards to uh, vehicular truck traffic that's uh, coming through here unexpectedly or passing through. Um, so do all truck vehicles have a, a, a label on it telling what, what they're carrying, that, that you have an idea as to what you're going to be dealing with? That's what I just said. Through you, Mr. Chair. Any, any, anything that's uh, um, dealing with 
dangerous goods. And it's, not, it's defined under the Transportation, Transportation, Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act. Right. Um, we'll have a placarding. So if it's, if it's not a dangerous good that falls under that act, we have no idea what it is and it shouldn't be any concern. Okay. Sometimes we don't want to know what's coming through here. I'm sorry? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Uh, so basically dealing with vehicular traffic, truck traffic, uh, dealing with those dangerous goods, also the train coming through, uh, are you able to handle any type of incident that would come up from the chemicals or material that they are using that you're able to handle in, in the future? If you, or is there items that you, that the fire department thinks that, well, we really don't, can't handle this because we don't have the resources or way of putting it out? And I don't know what they would be. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm try trying to think of a, 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 a good answer for that. I, I would say that uh, in order to deal with every possible incident that may occur out there, no, we're not able to, to handle that um, with the resources that we have on hand. Um, we, would, we would look at each incident uh, individually and then utilize the resourcing that's made available and if we can't use our own resources and require others that's when we declare an emergency within the community and then can look to the province to, to use other additional resources so we have lots of options in front of us um, I'm confident in, in our staff and in our service that we provide right now that we'd be able to handle uh, most uh, incidents uh, um, but any catastrophe such as we saw in Quebec would be beyond probably anybody's resources and would be looking to outside resources for help. Right. It was noted in the paper just last week that the uh, fire chief at Waterloo has been sworn to secrecy of knowing what's coming through. Have you had any connections with that? Or, or is, if you do get that information, are we all, are you held by secret that no, we can't do anything but it and just you and your staff that have to address that? Is this really the right way to go? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, again, we haven't had any dealings with the railways as of yet in terms of what their manifests are. So these are all agreements that would, we would have to look at. And if we were to obtain that information, it might be through some confidentiality agreements that are put into place that, uh, um, you know, we don't want the public, uh, you know, and I, and I don't mean it to say that we don't want the public to be safe. We want the public to be safe, but if, that information was to turn up in the wrong hands, um, then there could be other areas that uh, of, of concern, i.e. terrorism, um, sabotage, uh, things like that that may take place. Right. So you got to protect uh, everything. And I, and I, I do believe uh, that the transportation of dangerous goods over rail has been safe in this city of Kitchener, uh, but anything is possible. Right, okay, thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Singh. Singh. Yeah, thank you. I have no questions. I think the, the motion is very clear. I just want to commend Councillor Ravenovich to, to bring this forward. And uh, from the very unfortunate uh, incident that happened in Quebec, I think this is a, a learning step forward. And uh, it's, uh, it's appropriate to put in uh, uh, protocols that would enhance public safety. So we'll definitely support this. Those in favor? Oh, sorry. Record a vote has been asked for. We now vote. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Motion to go into caucus for those items. Councillor Arnides, Councillor Davy. Those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Right, we'll adjourn. Sorry, Sorry. is there a time, timing Sorry. for? Oh, yeah, hang on. Sorry, I forgot about bylaws. Bylaws for three readings, moved by Councillor uh, uh, Zanetsky, seconded by Councillor Davy. Those in favor? Approve. And the one we just dealt with, the bylaw. The um, this is related to the the lot maintenance. Okay. Those in favor again? Opposed? That's carried. And what time are you um, convening? 